I don't think screen sharing is working. Let me check why. Do you see anything? You see an empty desktop. So I think you have shared the wrong screen, maybe. So the, the idea was to PowerPoint just, do you see now something on that desktop? Yes. Now okay, so, presentation. okay, sorry about this. It's a, it's a laptop I reinstalled here, so starts asking for permission. So welcome everyone to this uh, short introduction to the SPEC research group uh, that I will try to keep to 15 minutes. And as Nicholas introduced, uh, I'm chairing this group together with Andre van Hoorn from the University of Hamburg. Uh, the group itself is made of uh, five subgroups or working groups. And you, here you see these working groups listed, uh, starting with cloud, chaired by Alexandre Osup, security, DevOps, power, and predictive ana data analytics, which is the latest group that was formed. Uh, I'm going to introduce these groups in more detail, but generally, what are the activities of SPEC Research Group? First of all, the individual work within these working groups, focusing on research and also collaborations with industry. Uh, on the other hand, cross-cutting, we, ca we have a repository of peer-reviewed tools and data sets where people could have their data sets and tools reviewed and published on the SPEC website and also publicized through SPEC. And they also get the endorsement respect. Then we have a portal for performance related resources on our website. We organize conferences and workshops. For example, ICPE is a conference that is co sponsored by SPEC Research Group. And uh, yes, this, we, we founded this conference in 2010. So it was launched by initiative driven by SPEC Research Group and the WASP community. So coming back to the working groups, here you see uh, a brief overview. I'm starting with the cloud group, uh, chaired by Alexandre Yusup and Nicolas Herbst that just spoke. This is a very active group. It organizes also the Hot Cloud Perf workshop that took place also at this conference a couple of days ago. Uh, there was the Dutch tool seminar on serverless computing, which was a major activity last year in May, uh, where a lot of other activities were started and are still running. Actually, we have even you know, regular meetings now continuing as part of the follow-up work on that seminar. Um, and also this group has uh, a lot of tangible results that they, they can show, for example, 2021, some major milestones here published in, in high quality uh, journals and conferences, especially this one the first one about state of serverless applications, but also the other ones are really milestones in the work of this group. There are also awards that were won at middleware on this topic. Yeah, if you're interested in the latest cloud platforms and also uh, future directions, this is the right, uh, the right group to work with. They're also working on a serverless benchmark, big data workloads, and edge to cloud survey. Moving on, the DevOps performance working group is also one of the most active working groups, which focuses on the interplay between DevOps and performance engineering. Uh, the activities of this group are centering around uh, next generation cloud applications based on microservices and serverless platforms. So there is some overlap here with the cloud group, as you see. However, this one is more focused on the development and operations, DevOps concepts uh, and architectures and less focus on the platforms themselves in terms of cloud computing, platform scalability uh, and so forth. But there is some overlap and actually also in terms of people involved, there are some people on both sides. Uh, they also have other activities here, performance change point detection, model extraction and refinement, continuous delivery infrastructures and their performance, resilience engineering. These are just samples of interesting 
contributions they are working on. And here you see the most active participants in this DevOps group. And uh, some highlights from last year. There were monthly calls uh, and also additional on-demand calls. Uh, some publications emerged here in a Journal of Software and Systems and also in IEEE Transactions on Software Engineering. Some joint physicists were supervised and also uh, a special issue in the EMSE journal. The RG Security Working Group is focusing on the specific topic of hypercore injection. And we believe that hypervisors are uh, a general platform nowadays used everywhere and it poses a security threat and that's why investigating the interfaces to hypervisors and how they could be misused is a major topic of this group so it's about security generally but the, the focus right now is on virtualization security and investigating hypercore security so you see also that there is some touching points or overlaps in a way with robustness and testing of software systems. You consider basically the hypervisor as a software system that you test by injecting hypercodes and seeing how they behave. And this is an active collaboration with Coimbra with some very nice results, emerging papers and uh, benchmarking tools that are developed as part of this group. The RG Power Working Group uh, is chaired by uh, Maximilian Meissner. He's also here, at, I think, in the group and generally at the conference. He gave a tutorial, some other presentations earlier in the conference. And uh, this group uh, has also produced a lot of results. As you see here, some examples from 2021 and 2022. They are regularly publishing at ICPE especially on energy efficiency of servers, but also of software systems. And here you see example of considering common sorting algorithms and their energy efficiency and how they behave. Uh, as you can see some examples here, it's by now quite an interesting set of topics and broad. Originally it was mostly about server energy efficiency, but now it has been broadened significantly. And uh, this is very exciting. They are also considering to further introduce new topics such as, for example, serverless computing and its energy efficiency implications. Here also you see some work in progress papers at this conference. I mentioned the tutorial and also one at the workshop PEX. The last group is the predictive data analytics group. Andre Bauer is heading this group. He's also here. It was established uh, just in June 2021. Uh, it has bi-weekly group meetings. And uh, yeah, here you see the leadership of this uh, working group. Pretty much every group has these kind of four major positions. Some, some have additional positions that drive the work of this group. So here are some of their results. For example, the first international workshop on performance data analytics and data management that it was part of this conference. Uh, also a data challenge paper that was published here, a poster paper. And in terms of future and outlook, uh, the focus will be on anomaly detection benchmarking and uh, how the state of the art in data analytics is evaluated, basically understanding what the current state of things is in order to define what the missing points are and what challenges need to be addressed. So this group is in an early stage still establishing basically the goals for the next years. So this is my very brief overview. Uh, so despite uh, starting a little bit uh, later we managed to keep the 15 minutes uh, and uh, now I'm open we have a couple of minutes I'm open for questions if everyone if anyone wants to ask something or this is also the idea of this presentation not just to give some slides and but also to address questions
Okay, I hear no questions. So uh, if anyone is interested in joining or whatever, feel free to mail me. And also you're welcome to visit our meetings. It's a very open community. It's not some closed uh, group of people that, you know, just uh, isolate themselves. It's a very open minded and open, nice community. So feel free to join. We're very happy to have additional people involved. Thank you very much. And now I turn it over to the next point in the agenda, Nicholas. Okay, thank you, Sam. Um, as second part of this um, agenda item or for today, we have uh, scheduled a 15 minute talk by the winner of the SPEC Kavaya Dixit dissertation award. Um, uh, the dissertation and it's Andre Bauer who won it this year. You can also see it uh, on the SPEC RG website, um, how it came to this decision. Um, and now we get some insights into the dissertation. Andre, are you here? Yes, ready. I'm ready to start? Yep. Go ahead. There are also 20 minutes for, um, uh, five minutes for questions and you can also start putting the questions in the Slack channel. So I hope you will see now the right screen. I guess it's a yes if nobody is complaining. Yep. So thanks, first of all, it's a honor for me to present today my PhD thesis at ICDE. And my thesis was about time series forecasting, how to design it, benchmarking, and with different use cases. And while speaking of forecasting, we human try to forecast or to foresee upcoming events for thousands of years. So if we look at the early stage of mankind, we were observing bird flights and try to interpret how this flight may affect our future. Or if you look at the Greek time, people went to Delphi to get some prophecies. And during all these years, this occult rights evolved to an established research field. And around about 50 years now, time series forecasting is an active research topic with applications in many domains. So now one could ask, if there are so many domains and plus so many different approaches, is, now, is there not one method or one forecaster that performs best for all time series? It would be nice to have such an answer, but unfortunately the no free lunch theorem denies this possibility because it says there's no globally best method. I can give you a quick example. We have here in time series, the real data is depicted in black, and we have two different forecasting methods depicted here in red and blue. We clearly see that red is the best method on this time series. But if you're looking on another time series from another domain, we see that blue is here a better method. That means that each method has its benefits and drawbacks depending on the use case. So the question is still open, how to find now the best forecasting method for my certain application or use case? Well, the common practice is to do trial and error or to ask an expert. However, these both approaches are prone to errors and may take some time. And especially, for example, for auto scaling, that was a use case in my thesis. I cannot wait for an expert to, to give me and answer what forecasting method I should now use when my workload is changing. And to give you maybe a better overview of what I did in my thesis, besides this tackling of what's the best forecasting method, I highlighted some of, some of my research questions now. So one of the questions was, for example, how to automatically benchmark different forecasting methods in a diverse set of application scenarios or how to design an automated and generic forecasting approach, combining the strengths of existing forecasting methods. And in addition, how to automatically extract and transform features to increase the forecast accuracy. And as I said, I had also um, auto scaling as a part or as a use case. I also 
try to answer the question, what are some meaningful combination of proactive and reactive scaling techniques to minimize the risk of auto scaling operation because auto scaling is somehow lacks trust in um, business. So, and to answer these questions and of course other questions also, my PhD thesis had three main contributions. The first one is a forecasting benchmark. The idea here is to provide an automated approach for comparing methods on a level playing field. It was published on the proceeding for IEEE and also I um, presented it last year on the ICPE. When telescope where is the idea to have an automated and generic forecasting method that combines existing methods to combine their strengths and compensate for their drawbacks. And the ideas and parts were published on these publications. And last is Camulton, that is a hybrid autoscaler that combines proactive scaling with reactive fallback as a safeguard. And here were parts and ideas were published on these conferences and the underlying conferences were first authorships. So due to the time constraint, I cannot speak of uh, about all contributions I would like to, but I have to focus on one and that's telescope. So that means I will guide you the next slides from the contribution telescope. But first of all, I will start with the related work to give you a kind of feeling how it's done currently. So when speaking about hybrid time series forecasting, the main idea is to have at least two different forecasting methods that are combined so to com compensate for each other's drawbacks. And this field can be split into different areas. The first one is ensemble forecasting. This is the historical oldest group. And the idea is here to have a set of forecasting methods. And each method is doing a forecast. In the end, all these forecasts are combined for a final forecast. Another group is method recommendation. Here, I learn from a time series different features, extract features. And then I have the dynamically learned rules. And based on the features, I know what the best method is for a certain time series. And the last group is time series decomposition. Here, the main idea is to decompose time series into different components. And then each component is forecast by the best suited method. On the end, the components are uh, assembled to form a final forecast. In these three areas, there uh, had been a lot of uh, active research in the last years. And based on my experience, I can say the existing open source methods from these fields are tailored for giving domain or data set. That means they lack of generic. They are poorly automated. It's a high effort to get them run. They exhibit an unpredictable time to result. So coming back to the auto scaling scenario, I cannot wait, for example, two days for getting a forecast when I need it the next minute as a forecast. And they are computer, uh, computational intensive. And because of these shortcomings, I came up with idea to develop telescope because I started first in my PhD life with auto scaling. And telescope can be located here between method recommendation and time series decomposition. And the underlying idea of telescope is first to extract information from a given time series. And then based on this information to split the time series into different components that is shown here on the right hand side. And when each of these components are forecast separately, and when in the end, an regression based method is applied to assemble the final forecast as, as, as accurate as possible. And the workflow that telescope is using can be split into five different steps. The first one is pre processing. Then we have a feature extraction, model building, forecasting, and in the end, post processing. I will guide you in the next slides through each of your steps. So you will get a good understanding about how telescope works. So in the pre-processing step, the first thing we look, have a time series that may look like this. And then we want to extract from this time series the most dominant frequencies. What do I mean with frequencies? I mean the length of repeating patterns like days, weeks, months, and so on. And the most 
dominant frequencies are, for example, days in years because they are more frequently and have higher amplitudes in this periodogram as shown here. And moreover, beside this estimation of a frequency, I also transformed the time series. It looks, for example, like this and has some uh, benefits. For example, I reduce noise. I reduce the effects of multiplicative uh, compositions and I shape or, or I try to shape the data to normal distribution. And then the information I got from a pre-processing phase, I use then in the future extraction phase. And here I look at the transform time series and then I extract the trend component, the season component and the ergal part. So the ergal part, it's the leftovers after I remove the trend and the seasonal component from a time series. And I also extract the Fourier terms of the most dominant um, frequencies. The Fourier terms are simple say just cosine and sine functions with their respective frequencies. And then I use these features for learning a regression based model, a model to uh, reflect the time series. That means I have here my transform time series, but this and but before learning this time series, I have to do uh, to make it stationary. That means I have to first remove a trend because the trends violates the aspects of stationarity. So I remove the trend component that I extracted one step before, and then I get the detrended time series. And then I use the extracted Fourier terms and the season component and feed both information into machine learning method. And as a target, it has the detrended time series. That means the forecasting method, uh, the machine learning method learns from a recurring pattern and recurring pattern with kind of differences. So in other words, the machine learning method tries to learn how these differences came up all for have only recurring patterns or to be more precise, the machine learning method learns indirectly the irregular part. And as I spoke before, or on the first slide about the no free lunch theorem, I do not um, rely only on one machine learning method. I choose for each time series the best suited machine learning method, and that's done by recommendation system. But in online scenarios like in auto scaling, always XGBoost is selected because XGBoost is quite accurate and fast. And then after I learned the how this um, time series model can be built, I can forecast it. So the first step is to forecast the patterns. Per definition, they are recurring, so I can simply um, repeat them with this formula. And then I fed the forecast future, I have a forecast season and Fourier times into machine learning model, and then I get the future teacher and the time series. And to get the real time series, I have to add the trend. That means I have to forecast the trend components, and herefore I use ARIMA. The formula is depicted here on the right hand side, and it consists of an auto regressive part. It is difference d times, and it should be equal to the moving average part. The, d, the differencing d times means I um, use the difference of a time series and do this d times until I have a stationary time series again. And then I add the future trends to a future digital time series and then get a future transformed time series. And so in the last step, I have to inverse the transformation and then I get the future time series that may look like this here, depicted in red. And in the course of my PhD, I also evaluated telescope. And for this, I did an extensive evaluation. It, Took me 22,000, uh, I performed 22, 72,000 forecast, and it took almost 14,000 hours to perform this forecast. And I investigate 15 different state of the art methods. And for the next slides, I only show the best classical method, that is uh, S Arima, the best machine learning method, that is XGBoost, and five hybrid methods. Whereas from these five hybrid methods, 
there was one developed by Uber, that's ESRNN, and Preford, uh, that was developed by Facebook. And I also, for this slide, show only two different measure, measures in my PhD fees. I use more parts to make it compact. I will only show the symmetrical mean epsilon percentage error and the normalized time to result. And to give you an idea how it looked like, we see here on the right hand side a time series. And on the left side of this time series was the history or training. On the right hand side, it is um, the test or future. And below, we see the forecast of the different forecasting methods. And we see that all of these forecasts are somehow reasonable. So everything works well. Here is the summarized evaluation. We perform all forecasts, a forecast on 400 different time series and repeat it this 100 time. And what we can see here is the average measures, what I mentioned before. And we see that telescope is the most accurate method and it has a low and a reliable time to result. If I use telescope with a recommendation system, it means changing the machine learning methods that is up incorporated within, then I get a bit more accurate, but it is lower because, as I said before, XGBoost is the fastest one, and there are methods that are slower, and therefore it's a trade-off between accuracy and um, speed. Then if I look at SRIMA, SRIMA is the best competing method, but it's about 6,000 times slower than telescope and then I have also XGBoost. XGBoost is faster than telescope because it is standalone, but it's less accurate. And I, we look at Uber and Facebook, we see that telescope outperforms both methods. And yeah. So I want to summarize now my thesis. I will now say some things, but you have to believe me because I couldn't show it. But the forecast benchmark that I developed enhanced the comparability and of forecasting methods guides the selection of a forecasting method for a specific use case. Telescope fully automates the forecasting process without any assumption about the time series, has an accurate and reliable forecast, is available in GitHub, and is already applied in different projects. Then we have Camulton that enables reliable and accurate scaling, minimizes the charge cost, and increases the user experience, and I hope it increases the trust in autoscalers. And of course, with my PhD thesis, not everything is solved. There are some open challenges, like telescope only supports univariate time series forecasting. It would be nice to support multivariate times forecasting. For example, if I want to um, forecast the electricity demand, the temperature would also nice to have information. And to, another thing is to detect structural change, because after a change, I may either discard information before the change or encode this change as features. And for Camulton, I could combine horizontal and vertical scaling to have another um, complexity on my autoscaler or to consider energy efficiency scaling. So these are my references. I'm now done with my presentation and happy for any questions. Thank you for the nice talk. You're welcome. Are there any questions in the audience? If yes, you can directly speak up and try to formulate it later also in the Slack channel. While the people are thinking, I have one question. Um, first of all, I like the work a lot and uh, I think it's good to see the, the, the results, but Andre, could you, elaborate a bit on the assumptions that telescope has uh, so in other words what types of time series telescope likes more than others and where is it not applicable so to get some feeling about when you should apply it and when not yeah um first of all telescope as i said before is only concepted for universal time series that means if you have different time series that's can be correlated and could therefore used for achieving a better forecasting accuracy. Telescope may be used on each of them, but it would be more beneficial to combine the information. But besides this, it's a strong limitation is 
the telescope, for example, assumes that there is no missing data within the data. So I cannot use data where, for example, if you look at weekly data, Monday and Wednesday is missing. So one assumption is really that the data is there. And one of the benefits of telescope is this recurring patterns that it extracted. So the uh, sweet spot is, of course, um, seasonal time series. The longer, the better, because the more data is available, the better it can be forecast. But there's also a fallback for non-seasonal time series. But from a non-seasonal time series, less information can be extracted because the seasonal components and the Fourier terms are not a inside per definition. And then it's kind, let's call it a lightweight version of telescope. And then it's not that good as I would um, incorporate all this other information. And the other thing what I try to highlight is when there's a structural change in the data, telescope may have problems because STL, that is one uh, major building block of telescope, assumes non-changing uh, seasonal components. But if I have a structural break, for example, if I look at, at an, let's say, economic time series and there is an huge impact like finance crisis or whatever, and then the shape of um, the time series changes of a seasonal component, or maybe an even better um, example is that, for example, in Australia, the he, uh, peak amount of energy was during winter for heating, but with the rise of air conditions, it changed in the summer was the peak of um, in the seasonal component. And this is a structural change. And STL, for example, would not be able to handle this. And therefore, telescope, which relies on STL, would make wrong um, forecast. OK, thank I hope you. this answered the question. It was a long yeah. answer, but. So I, I got that, yeah, you, you may not apply it for flood floods or corona waves or etc no. but for um, seasonal patterns etc um i see heng li um, raising a hand please go ahead uh, yes uh, can you hear me yes, yes. Uh, I, 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 thank you andrew for your interesting uh, talk congratulations so my question is uh, um so uh, to be I, to be like a, to make a time series analysis a practical, useful, and uh, also accurate. So based on your experience, um, so how long should we like uh, predict for the future? Like, uh, is that within one cycle, like one day, one week, or like beyond one cycle? So what is your experience on this? Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um... I would always go for the shortest time horizon because the longer the horizon is, the more the um, data distribution may change and more the error grows over time. So if you look usually at time series forecast with a prediction interval, it's kind of increases quite with the time. So I would go with a, as short as possible, I would say, and but it depends also on the time series. So if the for example, the time series is slowly changing when you can have a longer forecast as if it's a very, let's say, volatile time series. So it really depends on the use case. But I would always say for like, even I think the best one would be only one point forecast, but it depends on the use case. Maybe if you're speaking of auto scaling, in my experiments, I was forecasting 15 minutes at means 15 points in the future I forecast and was a good number. So I wouldn't go for too long. I hope this helps. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, can I have a follow up? Like, uh, uh, so is there any like a rule, like, uh, like a golden point, like for example, a fraction of the cycle, the cycle I mean like uh, a period, like one day, one week, uh, uh, the Python within the data. Is there any rule that, uh, for example, ten percent or like uh, fifty percent of the cycle that is a good point to to, to get an accurate result and be useful? Well, um, I'm afraid I cannot give you a number here. I think it really depends on the time series. So, I mean, you speaking of cycles, there's very um, let's say high frequency cycles like. 
hourly cycles or if you speak about yearly cycles. So it really depends what kind of cycle we're speaking of. But um, I think I would also here go for really um, short or low percentage of a cycle. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Andre. Thank you, it's very clear. So we have time for one more question, um, David. Yeah, hey, thanks again for the talk. Um, I love seeing the totality of how everything fits together. Uh, it's really kind of cool. Um, so I just had a quick question that may not, um, well, let me just ask it. So you have this slide comparing all of the techniques and there was um, a trade-off in accuracy and, and total execution time. Uh, and I was just wondering if, especially if you had systems with lots and lots of time series, if there was a way to maybe leverage that to use the um, use the quick and fast for the easy cases, and then maybe when you detect something from that, switch to the harder ones, or that could just be completely crazy because the amount of time it takes to build up the the more accurate ones. It's a good question. So the question goes toward like kind of meta learning or like like having an abstraction level above level above that looks, for example, okay, we have like minute based forecast. But if something goes wrong, we will use a better one that has a more accurate forecast, but will take some more time. I mean, if you have a time for doing this, I would always go for this because in some things, it makes sense to have long-term forecast. So mm. for example, if I'm planning, for example, a new um, data center, it's fine if I have a forecast for one year. And if your forecast is somehow um, bad, it will average over time. So I don't have to know like exactly per day, a day, but I need somehow a rough number about the daily um, or the average um, workload that will come. And what if I have like a dynamic thing? So I have a, let's say, time series on minute base. I can do it, but I can, for example, then in the and background to have a forecast that may take longer and then exchange, for example, results if the other is available. So what I did, for example, in my PhD thesis, because I had different um, ideas at the beginning, for example, I used Arima before and I had the, the kind of rule, I did a lot of forecasts, like 10 or 15. And then I tried to do a new forecast, but if a forecast was not already there, I used the old ones, but when a new was there, I um, dismissed them because the newer forecast had more or better or newer uh, information. So it was always the, the new forecast overrides the old one, but it, um, but it had to be there. So I tried to do it, but as you said in your question, it makes totally sense to have like two forecasts working, maybe as fast one, but is maybe less accurate, but a more accurate one, but takes longer. And then depending on who is faster, who can um, then provide a forecast because you need them in your planning. You cannot wait. Right. You see, okay. Andre is very enthusiastic about his topic. <laughs> I, it's hard to interrupt him. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, sorry. Stopping the it's session now. We, no, the we are only two minutes over, but it's a short leg stretcher break so you can all uh, have a short break and the speakers of the next session can already prepare and give a sign that they are there. The next session will be chaired by Varshar and for all that wanted to uh, pose some questions to Andre, he will be here and is also like very available <laughs> to you, I would say. Let's thank Andre again. Thanks. And, yeah, see you in the next session. Hi Nicholas, I think I'm I'm the first one, so I'm here. <laughs> Hi Mark. Hi Osha. And uh, is uh, Mikhail here? Yeah, I'm here. And uh, Martin. Yes, and I'm also here. Yeah. And Kim, I've already exchanged. Some messages with me. Okay, so so. Uh,
um, Mark, do you have a uh, screen sharing permission? Uh, seems like it. Let me try. You can go ahead and share the screen or. Uh, yes. Or maybe, uh, give me a minute. I will share once to show the whole session and then you can share. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let me do that once. Yeah. <clears throat> Is it visible, the my screen? Yes. yes. OK. OK, I'll just start quickly, because uh, as far as I can tell, it is 6.15. Nicholas, shall I start? Yep. Maybe. OK. Yeah, so welcome, everybody, to the session on empirical studies of performance. Uh, we have some uh, really interesting uh, practical papers uh, with a lot of uh, hands-on measurements. Um, and um, so there are four papers. Uh, there are three short papers and one full paper. And uh, without further ado, I think I will just start with the first one. I'll just uh, introduce the names. Uh, the authors are Mark Lesnick, Johannes Broman, Nina Kliche, Andre Bauer, Daniel Siebold, Simon Eisman, Samuel Kunev, and Jörg Domashka. I hope I did okay with the pronunciations. The name of the paper is same, same, but dissimilar, exploring measurements for workload time series similarity. Uh, Mark, you have five minutes for the presentation and five minutes for Q&A. So I think I'll just give you a, a verbal um, uh, 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 alert if, if you're close to the time and looks like going over. Okay, at around yeah, sure. uh, five minutes, I will actually give you because we have some some flexibility in whether it's five, five or six, four and so on. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, why don't you start? I'll stop sharing my screen. Yes, thank you. So hopefully you can all see my screen now. Uh, so basically our work was interesting enough, inspired by us actually reading, I just found it on my desk. I was reading this book, it's called Statistics Done Wrong. And I can uh, actually uh, recommend it to all of you. So our, our well, general idea was to look at how uh, measurement evaluations in uh, benchmarking is performed, right? So if we think about the core of benchmarking, then of course we think we, do, we talk about we think about repetitions, right? So if we look at those uh, ten measurements that I'm showing you here, and if you just look at the scale of the numbers, right, then it's really easy. Of course, also it's easy because we mark the red ones in red, but it's quite easy to to, to determine which measurements are not really fitting here, right, and which are the odd ones out. But if we look at something like um, like this, right, where we have 10 repetitions, um, it becomes a bit more uh, more difficult. So essentially, um, our idea was how to look at, first of all, how do repetitions are performed in, in the current state of, uh, not repetitions, our evaluations are performed in the current state of the art, how people are approaching repetitions and how people are approaching actually finding out which are the odd ones out in those measurements, which we think is quite important. So basically, um, your experiments should always be based on multiple runs and I think we shouldn't uh, shouldn't even be discussed right and the outcome however is generally reported using some kind of a mean or a standard deviation um, but the problem is that volatile environments specifically cloud infrastructures and things like that they present um, with a multitude of behaviors which influences of course those measurements so we believe that those measurements should be in some way grouped as I showed you before those red measurements maybe should be excluded from from the from the behavior reporting right so otherwise your outliers might skew the results and so on and so forth, right? And the question is, of course, uh, how often should you measure? Uh, because of course, if you if you have uh, four measurements and two of those are bad, then 50% of your measurements are bad and this is not really feasible. And the second question is also, are mean and standard deviation even enough to report such things? So um, what we would like to have is some kind of an automatic analysis of time series, similarity and dissimilarity to be able to um, basically see those those um, bad bad uh, sheep in the measurements and what we did is we looked at over 1000 papers from from six uh, different proceedings so you see CICP mascots cloud SOC, and sigmot which was the biggest chunk of work as you can see here so over 1000 papers and it was a huge work for for, for all, all the authors 
And basically the inclusion criteria was quite easy and the exclusion criteria, so you just had to be published at this conference and the exclusion was uh, you didn't publish your data, your results data, uh, you didn't work with performance measurements, the measurements were simulated, for example, and not real, the, the authors reported aggregated values and uh, the repetitions were not enough, so people did not uh, only do, for, did, for example, three repetitions. And to our uh, sadness, let's say this, we actually find only three, we found only three data sets because the, the, the largest uh, problem that we found is while people performed a lot of, rep uh, performed the repetitions, they did not perform enough repetitions. For example, only three repetitions per measurement is, is not enough to, to, to basically uh, remove outliers, for example, right? And so um, what we then did is we looked at basically six similarity and dissimilarity metrics to measure the, the time series uh, similarity and dissimilarity between those runs that we've seen. Um, to basically um, have, a, have a better understanding of how they perform. And of course, you do not want uh, 12, 12 measurements performing on your data. So what we then did is basically a correlation analysis to see how those different performances stack against each other, which can be grouped, which cannot be grouped, uh, to see what, what basically uh, major groups of, of uh, similarity and dissimilarity measurements we can perform on different time series uh, measurement data to see if the, the specific runs are similar or dissimilar to each other, and then be efficiently able to weed out uh, specific outliers in your measurement, right? And so what we came up with for the data sets, uh, as you can see, the, I think it's, it's, it's quite, quite, quite obvious that the cosine measurement, for example, as you can see in the blue here, is very uh, heterogeneous to, to, to all the others. Uh, the, the wave hedges, same thing, scaled RMSE and Kumar Hasselbrook. So basically, uh, for example, if we look at uh, Kulshinsky 2 metrics and the uh, Bray Curtis, right uh, here, uh, we can definitely see that there's a very high correlation. So there's there's no meaning in performing uh, two of those calculations where, which, where one is uh, sufficient enough. And what we then did is basically um, looked at those uh, four measurements and uh, performed uh, based on those uh, and, and an overall calculation. So we averaged them together to have only one value. And based on this one value, we clustered the data that we uh, that we had into specific groups to be able to actually see uh, the specific uh, uh, groups in in the measurements. And as you as you saw before, as I showed you in the results, I have these red groups and then blue groups and so on to see what what measurements actually perform as outliers, what not. Um, and the results are quite varying. So what we've seen is that for some measurements, and as you, as we've seen before, the, the mean is enough, but for some it it isn't. The biggest uh, struggle that we actually faced is uh, the threshold of the clustering of all these things, right? So you, you always um, have the problem of if once you have a mathematical model, you would need another mathematical model stacked against that if you'd like to, to not have the threshold there, right? So what we ideally would like to have is some kind of a gold standard data set. We would tune against it and then uh, be able to do that. However, it, 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 it seems to be quite difficult. So... Um, there's a lot of results and observations, and I invite you to, to check them out in a paper. We, we, we have uh, everything there. We have a, a, another four pages of supplementary material with, where we explore the data, where we show uh, different pictures. And we have our artifact code, where you can, which you can use to, to perform your own measurements and your own similarity measurements on, on the data. And what I would actually like to do is end with a call to action, right? So we've, we've looked at over 1,000 papers. Um, and what we've oftentimes seen is that uh, the, the biggest part is if the AI authors perform the, the necessary steps, often they do not perform the necessary petitions. And what we've also unfortunately seen is that even authors that use public data do not make their own data and results available or only maybe the code, right? Um, and oftentimes, even if the code is live or was live, that's, that's the key point here, uh, it's not. And uh, if, you, if you see, remember my slide from before, we started at 2018, right? So we've, we've only looking at publications which are three years old, where maybe the code or the website is not available anymore. So this is a, this is a huge, uh, um, from our side, a call to action of, of basically uh, making sure that this is available to the community um, for us to be able to even perform such things. Because as you can see, um, 1,000 stack to three data sets is, uh, is, is quite, um, well, yeah, bad, let's say it this way. And with that, um, hoping, uh, yeah, I'm uh, hoping uh, I, I did not rush this through, through it too fast, and I'm open to, to all your questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, so the floor is open for questions. We have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, let me check the uh, Slack. I don't see any questions in the uh, channel yet. I think uh, you can just unmute and ask your questions, if any. So um, I had a question, Mark. Um, can you, uh, oops, uh, tell uh, 
any specific so i saw that the the, the correlation is one major contribution uh, but i wanted to ask any other insight in terms of actually uh, predicting uh, the ground truth and first of all how did you get the ground truth how from the data sets how did you mark the outliers that's that's the biggest problem that i've mentioned so you you, you would need we didn't have that so you what you would ideally need is some kind of an ideal perfect gold standard data set where we would have the ground truth for the clusters right so what we did is was actually far more tedious because what we we had the, the the advantage of having a lot of authors so we simply went through the data and looked at what we, what with the results showed right since we had only three data sets it was it was uh, feasible uh, but it's also it was also a lot of a lot of um, measurements itself so um, this, this is quite a problem right but then once you have the, 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 the ground truth, right, you, you, and you have some kind of an ideal threshold for that, um, then the question of generalization arises, right? So then you, you're, not, you're not really sure how, how, how this can be transformed, uh, transferred, I'm sorry, uh, to, to, to some kind of a different data or some kind of a different time series with a, another um, similarity or another behavior as it is. So um, we believe that this should be definitely done on a per, per case basis. Um, but uh, as far as what we've seen in, in the measurements, we there was a lot of observations and interesting things that would have not been apparent by just using the mean and the standard deviation. So it's still a, a large advantage and a, and a very easy calculation to perform. I think uh, Corpal also has a question. Yes, 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 yes definitely. Um, okay, sorry, I think my uh, clock is going on beeping. Um, I had a follow up, but does anybody have any question? I think, and we're also, I think, oh, no, it's, it's, I think it's, it's, it's Philip, yeah. Philip, I'm sorry, Philip raised his hand, yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't really have a question. I'm, I mostly wanted to say that this is really good, very important work that you're doing here. And so the only thing that I kind of noticed is if you kind of do, if you continue this line of research, maybe it would make sense to also include some of the, uh, some channels in that, and especially empirical software engineering has, uh, published quite a bit of work on performance engineering recently. And um, so I say this somewhat biased as an editor of this journal. And many of these papers tend to go over my table nowadays somehow. <laughs> but um, uh, one thing, one of the reasons why I say this is because empirical software engineering journal also is pushing very hard for people to actually make their data sets available. So I have the feeling maybe you would find maybe more papers that actually provide the data and it's a bit easier to do that kind of analysis there and this is actually this is actually interesting enough our, our current future work so we're looking at those reproducibility checklists and what should be performed what should be expected of the authors that that publish um specifically going through the through, through those points of, of in what form the data should be published or how they how this should even be performed right because there's still no specific rules on how the how the benchmarking should be performed as far as we've seen it mm -hmm. Thank yeah, you. there are. You, you probably know there are these checklists for uh, reproducible science and so on. But making a hard rule of something like you need to provide your data tends to not go over so well because there are, everybody can think of cases where it's simply not feasible to do so. Yes, that's true. Okay, thank you, Mark, and thank you, thank you. for the questions. Uh, let's go to the next one. I'll stop sharing. Gail, uh, go ahead and share your screen. So this is a paper called, um, I think I lost my, um, studying the performance risks of upgrading Docker hub images, a case study of WordPress. And the authors are Mikhail Sabuhi, Peter Muselek, and Core Paul Bezimer. And uh, we have Michael with us too. Mikhail with us yeah. to present it. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Hello everyone. Hope you all having a great day today. My name is Mikhail. And uh, today I have the pleasure to present our recent paper titled uh, Studying the Performance Risk uh, of Upgrading Docker Hub Images, a Case Study of WordPress. Okay, let's start with some concepts related to the empirical study. Containers are st standalone lightweight units of uh, software that packages software code and all its dependencies. Uh, first, uh, first, we have infrastructure host operating system, Docker engine, and on top of that, applications are running in a container in an isolated environment. Then we have uh, Docker Hub, which is uh, Docker's um, main public registry. 
Uh, currently, there has been 318 million Docker image pools from Docker Hub, 8.3 million repositories, 7.3 million uh, Docker accounts, and 3.3 million Docker installations. This shows the popularity of this uh, technology. Docker images facilitate the deployment of applications in production environment. Users can do in-place upgrades to benefit from the latest release features and security patches. As I said, Docker Hub contains many repositories for different applications with different versions. The users can simply pull the images from Docker Hub and deploy them as containers in Docker host. Also, users can do in-place uh, in upgrades. When a new version of a specific application is released, on the Docker Hub, the user can simply pull the image and deploy the newest version on the Docker host. However, upgrading a Docker image will change the main application and its dependencies. For example, upgrading the WordPress Docker image will change the WordPress's Apache and PHP version of the application. And we believe that uh, this may cause hard to diagnose performance issue. Performance testing is not widely implemented practice in industry or by developers. And our hypothesis is that the same applies to the Docker images as well. Our methodology consists of three steps. First, collecting image information for WordPress, then deploying WordPress and identifying dependency version, then collecting and analyzing performance data. After collecting the performance measurement based on semantic versioning, we created patch, minor, and major version groups for WordPress and two main dependencies, PHP and Apache. When we say major group, we mean that the application should have same major version. When we say minor group, they should have same major and minor version. And when we say patch version, we mean they should have major, uh, same major, minor, and patch version. Uh, we calculated the relative average response time for doing patch to patch, minor to minor, and major to major upgrades. Here is an example of major upgrade, minor upgrade, and patch upgrade. So let's start with the results and discussion. Our first research question was, uh, what is the impact of upgrading the Docker image of WordPress on its performance? The wide variation, the relative response time, improvement for the studied upgrades indicate that it's hard to predict how performance will be affected based on the WordPress version in image alone. And also, this implies that the performance of the WordPress is mostly driven by other components in the image. Then we had a second research question, which is, uh, what is the relation between the performance of the WordPress application and updates of its dependencies? Uh, we observed that it's hard to predict how upgrading a WordPress image will change the performance based on the WordPress or Apache version. However, a major version upgrade of the PHP considerably improved the WordPress performance in all cases, implying that WordPress's performance is highly dependent on the PHP version. Also. Uh, during our case study, we observed that uh, none of the official WordPress images mentioned anything about the performance or response time. So as a result, the users uh, of such image have to either resort to other source of information, conduct their own performance tests, or simply take a gamble in terms of uh, performance when doing an image upgrade. So we believe Docker Hub uh, should allow users to provide performance measurements of an image as well. And also, uh, the types of changes that are allowed by the semantic versioning principle do not cover anything about performance. And as you know, the performance is increasingly important for a software and it's considered the new correctness. So we believe semantic versioning should be extended to cover performance changes as well. So to summarize this presentation, first I presented our methodology to uh, study the performance risk of upgrading Docker images. Then we answered, uh, what is the impact of upgrading the Docker image of WordPress on its performance? Then we answered, what is the relation between the performance of the WordPress application and updates of its dependency? Then we provided some recommendations. Uh, for, for more details about this study, you can refer to the original paper or watch uh, the uploaded pre-recorded video on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail. Um, yeah, the floor is open for any questions. I am looking for raised hands. Yeah, Heng, go ahead. Please unmute. And go ahead. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mikhail. Very interesting yeah. work. 
I can ask uh, uh, what kind of workload that you use to drive this uh, this uh, this uh, this applications to connect the performance metrics. Yeah, so we use the simplest workload. So it's a just a get request to the to the application. And we, the reason for selecting this simple workload is that we want to show that even for simplest workload, this performance variations can happen. And so we, the, it shows the uh, uh, importance of performance testing in Docker images. A great question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? We do have some time, Mikhail. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I try to finish it in five minutes. So. Yes. So Mikhail, uh, I, I uh, had one uh, question, sure. which is, uh, I mean, what would your, uh, what is the takeaway other than, you know, what uh, Docker Hub should do? Those who are pulling the doc images from Docker Hub, uh, yeah. what's the best advice to them from you? Yeah, so I, as I said, I believe that uh, the Docker Hub should allow users to provide performance measurements of an image along with the image. So the user can know whenever he's upgrading to a newer version of the application, you can uh, I mean, kind of know that whether it's going to impact the performance in a good way or in a bad way, right? If it's going to, I mean, if it's not a really important uh, up upgrade, so you don't need to upgrade it. If it's going to deteriorate the performance, uh, I mean, uh, really bad so what you what you do is that you don't upgrade right because but if yes. it's a security upgrade you, you really need to do that right uh, and yeah. you can and uh, it can compromise the performance as well so what was the we, worst like uh, you know what was the uh, how bad was it i mean you said that it was performance degrades but yeah, what's the worst so, you saw so it, it can go i mean we observed that it, it can be around uh, four hundred percent performance degradation, and also you can see like seventy eight percent performance improvement in some cases. So, okay. I mean, doing a blind upgrade. Okay. okay if uh, there aren't any other questions, then we can go to the next speaker. Um, so now uh, the next. Uh, uh, and thank you, Mikhail, for a nice talk. And thank you for the questions, everybody. Um, yes, so this next uh, paper uh, title is Why Is It Not Solved Yet? Challenges for Production Ready Auto Scaling, uh, presented by Martin Streiser. And the other co authors are uh, Johannes Broman, Joachim von Kistowski, Simon Eisman, Andre Bauer, and Samuel Kaunem. So, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks very much, Vasha, uh, for the introduction. Um, hello and a warm welcome also from my side. Um, I'm happy to present our our paper today. And this work has been uh, conducted, as said already, with some colleagues of mine from the University of Würzburg and also with, together with Joachim from uh, DATEV. And what we see when we look into um, state-of-the-art auto-scaling is that actually uh, when we look at research in this area, that we observe that there's a, quite a huge market of approaches. We have thing, we have approaches regarding machine learning, queuing theory, time series analysis, and so on. But still, people are coming also from the industry and asking us about um, new auto scaling approaches. We need advice in auto scaling. Auto scaling is still not solved yet, and we see that in practice only a small number of let's say advanced approaches are really in use and many cloud applications are operated with rather simple auto scaling mechanisms so for example here we see a configuration of a google cloud cpu based auto scaler and it has a rather simple configuration you see it with an easy utilization target and a cooldown period and Another example would be the default scaling formula, which is used in Kubernetes um, horizontal pod auto scaling. And it basically assumes that there is a linear relationship between the scaling metric and the desired number of replicas. And we see that in some cases, this can be quite a good enough approximation, but in many cases, it will not hold. And in our study, we now as, as 
try to assess why there is this significant gap between research and the auto scaling domain on the one hand and what's really used to practice on the other hand. Therefore, we first conduct an experimental study with a realistic hardware and software stack, which mirrors our environment present at our industrial partner. And in our experiments, we showcase limitations of classical threshold based autoscalers and show, for example, how overloaded services can influence the scaling behavior. Moreover, we also conduct some preliminary studies with more uncommon autoscalers, let's say, which, for example, use other than classical scaling metrics. In the second part of our paper, we state six core challenges that we see for autoscalers in production systems. These challenges are quite generic and not bound to specific environments. And that's why we think they can be used as possible future direction, uh, research directions also. And in the third part of the paper, we then analyze how recent literature addresses our stated challenges. And in the following, I will go shortly over these six challenges, while the experimental part and the literature analysis part is more covered in the paper. So the first challenge uh, we see is balancing proactive and reactive scaling. And normally, obviously, we would always like to scale proactively and know the exact resource demand in advance. This would be an optimal case. But in practice, we know that we, this is not really possible as we always have a limited, let's say, prediction accuracy. And let's imagine the following problem related to this. Uh, let's say we observe an unexpected high load in our system. And now we have to think about how we scale in this situation. As we have pro probably a predictive scaler running, it did not see it coming. So it might think the spike is just temporary and might suggest no, suggest no reaction or just a slight reaction probably. While the reactive autoscaler would suggest a strong reaction and possibly scale, uh, start, for example, uh, a huge number of new instances. The recent literature uh, here, we see in a related survey that only 15% of the surveyed paper really target this hybrid scaling, so combining proactive and reactive scaling. And it is rather simple how the responsibilities are divided. So reactive scalers are often used only for upscaling and only if uh, SLO violations are already present. The second challenge we see is combining application specific and generic platform metrics. Uh, recent literature al already discussed that hardware metrics like CPU and memory are always limited by design because they have also a limited value range and cannot always be used to derive resource demand. Modern microservices now expose many metrics which we can also use for scaling. In our study, we um, illustrate this with Spring Microservices, where we have 62 metrics per service available. And we observe different characteristics here. I just show you a easy test that we conducted also in the paper. Um, in this experiment here, we track the behavior of different application specific metrics with an increasing load intensity. So the brown curve here shows our load intensity. And you can see that we start with a really low load and end up with the high load. So it's basically linear uh, increasing load. And um, in order to show different metrics now in one diagram, we normalized our values. So one is a value of one is the observed maximum. And we end the, exper end the experiments here when our example services um, is unable to serve the first request. So when the first request times out. What do we see here? You can have a look at the red curve, which is the CPU utilization. And we see that in general, it follows quite nicely actually the uh, load intensity, but also the other metrics can be useful. For example, the metric here called threat ratio uh, might depict an early warning of a decreasing service capacity. So we see that it reaches its maximum value uh, actually some time before the actual problem uh, happens. And we see on the other hand 
that, for example, the green metric here uh, depicts clearly when there, there is an evolving or existing problem, or problem already. Because when we look at the last value here, we see, for example, that the CPU is not at the maximum level. So we had we already observed a CPU value which was higher than when the first uh, request timed out, basically. Okay, the third challenge, um, just to go over this as well, is keeping the configuration overhead for autoscalers as small as possible. What we observe is that the performance of autoscalers depend heavily on their configuration. And the optimal configuration for an autoscaler might be dependent on the service. So if you have a multi-service application for each of those services, there might be another configuration which is optimal. It can be quite dynamic because when we update our services frequently, the optimal configuration might change. And it depends on some uh, settings that we ha have in our use case. So for example, how do we weight additional costs against, for example, a minor rate of SLO violations? In general, we can say that the configuration of an autoscaler is always hard to determine, both for application developers, as they are not uh, really into the cloud environment possibly and not in the aspect of software per performance, but also for the cloud operators as they have not full insight into the code and the performance behavior of the services. Challenge four is a classical challenge for experimental studies. Um, we might have our scaling metrics, which are which can be unavailable, incomplete, inaccurate, or somehow delayed in our system. So we cannot always trust the input, uh, the value of our input matrix for the autoscaler. This is a really huge issue actually, because there are a lot of related problems which occur. For example, there might be uh, metrics which are unavailable when the service is overloaded, which would, which would be the exact time when we need to scale up, for example. And also service dependencies uh, can influence our scaling metric. And also we could, uh, bottle, we could uh, bottleneck shifting could occur. So if we scale up one uh, service, the bottleneck might shift to another service, and then we have problems again there and so on. Then we have um, our fifth challenge is combining autoscaling with other uh, mechanisms in modern cloud environments, for example, load balancing and resilience mechanisms. Um, here we discussed that uh, modern cloud management and container orchestration tools fulfill multiple tasks which influence autoscaling. In our paper, we explicitly discuss service restarts in terms of health monitoring, for example. And we also see that there's an increasing adoption of resilience mechanisms like circuits breakers, which influence the resource demand and therefore also influence autoscaling. And we see in the literature that only few studies explicitly combine those different aspects. And the last challenge, which is basically on top of all the others is keeping autoscalers still explainable. We see that a significant complexity might be needed to meet all the previously stated challenges. But in practice, we still need transparent decisions for our autoscalers. This does not necessarily mean that we have to like um, see how every operation goes and every calculation within the autoscaler. But in general, it might be good to have some factors which influence the scaling decisions, especially for predictive autoscalers. This does not only yeah, enables debugging, but also increases the trust in autoscalers. And that's where I also want to end uh, this presentations and presentation with a call for action, uh, where we, we think that autoscaling research would profit a lot from a stronger cooperation between academia and industry. Industry can provide more realistic workload traces, for example, example scenarios, services, realistic software and hardware stacks, and academia should increase the focus more on stated challenges and realistic evaluation of approaches. Especially we observe that many papers only simulate the autoscaler and do not conduct measurements in a real cloud environment. And our goal of the paper is basically to inspire future autoscaling research and hope that we can increase the use of research autoscalers in practice as well. Thanks very much for your attention and I'm happy for any questions. Thanks. 
Thank you, Martin. Um, yeah, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, if anybody wants, uh, can just raise hand. May I ask a quick question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned an important thing about the interaction between um, changing the uh, configuration, basically having optimal configuration when when we have auto scaling in place. Uh, so when auto scaling decision is done by the application itself, why couldn't be formulated as um, as a kind of optimization that incorporate both uh, basically finding optimal configuration as well as optimal uh, resource allocation because it it could be formulated as a multi-objective optimization problem isn't it um uh, yes uh, thanks very much for for your comment um the thing that we want to want to show here is basically um that let's say if we have uh a classical, think about a classical threshold based autoscaler. Um, there might be a setting which says, okay, my defined demand or threshold is like 70 or 80% CPU or something like this. And the thing of the, of the configuration is now that there might be one service in our overall application or microservice application, for example, where the 70% might be in totally optimal threshold and another one in, for another service, there might be 90% percent still uh, a good threshold or something like this. And also it might change over time. So that, that that's basically the challenge that also when we think about a DevOps context or anything or something like this, where we have like regular updates of our services, um, then basically it becomes hard to um, still like somehow track um, how should I reconfigure my auto scanning and so on. And that's why we argue in our paper that um, you're, you're right, we have to find the co basically the configuration also ourselves. So we basically speak of a self configuring auto scanner basically. And that's also a thing that we, um, we discuss in our paper also with regards to uh, reinforcement learning, for example, where this could be some like autonomic exploration of the configuration space and so on. And th these things we discuss in the paper as well, and also uh, highlight some advantages and disadvantages here. Uh, but 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 you're right, basically, it's, it's an optimization problem, and a really complex optimization problem, because many pa parameters can change at any time. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Great work. I like it. Uh, Murray has his hand raised. I think if you can uh, do the question and answer in a minute, then it'll be good. Go ahead. Thank you, Varsha. Um, so just following on from what you were saying, um, it seems to me you need to go behind the metrics that you're measuring to understand what it is about the individual microservices that makes 70% a good level for that microservice or makes the metric more or less sensitive. And um, so this implies, I hate to use the word, but this implies some kind of model, some sort of something which is more than just the measurements of the moment, which, which links measurements under different conditions and different, uh, and different times. And um, the philosophy of auto scaling is that this, these attributes should be obtained in real time, rather than provided in advance by a performance model like me. Uh, so the, uh, it seems to me this is the direction that your research would point me, that what can we learn from the application as it's running that will tell us more than just how it's performing at the moment, tell us how it might perform with different scales and, with, uh, and different um, configurations. Yes. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a great question. Uh, uh, definitely quite great comment because um, that that that's exactly the problem, especially when we when we talk about like these dynamic applications where we have recent updates and so on. Yeah. Um, it's hard to to capture this in a let's say rather static model or something like this. And really, that that that's really a good a, a good point. That if the point that we make also is if we have those, let's say in our case, it's over 60 metrics. And the, the thing is, what can we learn from these metrics? You're right. And um, these are obtained at runtime. 
and that that's definitely a point we make also for future research that we have to uh, get this metrics and use this metrics while a lot of papers are currently focusing only for example on cpu and memory and um yeah, we have to we have to use the the information that that is exposed and also think about what can we learn from this. That's that's definitely a correct insight. Yeah, and this points us towards machine learning, which is the next session. Yes, uh, <laughs> the next session. Yeah. Thank you, Martin. Thanks, Marie, for that question. And uh, Hing, I, uh, I would suggest can you post the question on Slack because we need to move on to the last uh, presentation. Kim, go ahead and share your screen. Yes. Yes. Uh, so the next presentation is, uh, the talk is called Evaluating the Scalability and Elasticity of a Function as a Service Platform. Uh, Kim long is going to present it. The co-authors are Joydeep Mukherjee, Zhen Minjiang, and Marin Litu. Yep, Over to you, sure. Kim. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sure. And please let me know if you can see my slide. Yes, everything's fine. You can go okay, into yeah. yeah. Uh, hello, start. everyone. Uh, my name is Kim Long. Um, we are from uh, York University in uh, Toronto, Canada. And today it is my pleasure to uh, present to you about the, um, our evaluation on the scalability and elasticity of uh, function as a service. Um, so uh, this is uh, our motivation. Uh, as we know, FIAS offered to us the auto-scaling uh, um, capability, meaning the user doesn't need to care on the uh, resource allocation and uh, capacity planning. Uh, so the uh, for that we would like to formulate and understand that how good is uh, the auto scaling, and we formulate our research question one, which is to focus on the scalability and elasticity characteristic of the uh, FAAS. Uh, so for RQ two, we move one step further because um, we know that FAAS uh, up uh, capacity uh, is not unlimited. So we examine at the saturation point where FAAS has reached to the um, the, the upper limit, what will happen and what can you do to improve the performance at that saturation point. Uh, so first, let's take a look at the RQ1. So in this RQ1, we evaluate the scalability by using multi-concurrent uh, clients. Uh, we use the J Apache JMeter with uh, 100 threads as our pool of clients, and we control the intensiveness of the workload by using two parameters, the ramp up time and the total number of requests. So ramp up time is the duration uh, we allow Jmeter to ramp up to 100 threads. We have four levels, uh, 10 seconds, 6, 3, and 1 second. So if the ramp up time is really short, it means the workload is so intensive. And similarly, we also have a different number of um, uh, requests, like we have three sizes, 1,000, 3,000, and 7,000, uh, from low, medium, to high. And to evaluate, we use these four metrics. We first, we measure the number of instances that cloud providers spawn to address the workload burst. Secondly, we measure the ramping duration, which is the duration for the cloud provider to ramp to the expected number of instances. For example, if the test require 100 instances, so that will be measured at the, the duration from the first request until the request that is first served by the 100 instance. And next, we measure the throughput and median response time. And this is our design. So we use JMeter here to directly in, uh, invoke the three testing cloud function on three platform, AWS, Lambda, IBM, and Azure cloud functions. And here is our findings. So we, we find out that uh, different cloud platform, they adopt different scaling strategy. For example, AWS, Lambda, and IBM, they scale the number of instances quite similar to the number of uh, uh, threads from JMeter. But for Azure cloud function, the uh, the number of instances are quite smaller because they each of their instance can handle multi-concurrent requests. And <clears throat> when the workload becomes more intensive, we observe on all three cloud provider that more, more instances will be provisioned and they, they ramp up their fleet uh, very quickly, especially AWS Lambda, to address the workload bust. So because of this uh, research addition, the um, throughput also increased accordingly. And initial at the at the start of the test, uh, the the bus we see that medium response time time to go so high, but along the time, uh, the response time uh, tends to be stable and reduce to a lower value. And next, um, in RQ two, we examine the FAS under saturation uh, condition. So um, at the FAS um, does not scale out of the out of the board. It has the maximum concurrency limit. 
So for that to examine, we actually have to scale down the maximum um, capacity. Uh, AWS Lambda can go up to 1,000 instances, but that will be too huge to test. So we scale it down to 100 instance maximum. Azure Cloud Function, we allow one instance can serve only one concurrent request and see how it goes. And for Jmeter uh, client, we can fix much more number of threads compared to the, the capacity. So we have 150, 200, and 250 compared to 100. Uh, we have five, seven, and 10 threads in Asia because in all our experiment, we observe only around four to five instances Asia uh, cloud provider will spawn. And similarly, we also measure the number of function instances, uh, the number of pass, fail, the total request, and success rate is calculated as the ratio between the pass and the total request, and throughput and response time for evaluations. And this is our structure. We have JMeter here, and we have our testing, our testing function around here. And we move one step further to, in, to introduce a workload smoother in between the JMeter and the, um, and the testing cloud function. So this uh, workload smoother is a Spring Boot application where it has two thread pool inside with the thread pool size will be corresponding to the downstream uh, cloud function. Let's say we have 100 here and 100 here. Similarly, we have around five and four around here. And our idea is because each of the thread pool here will have an unbounded queue. So we use a queue mechanism to queue the excessive requests and see whether it will improve the performance. And this is our findings. When we use the direct invocation, of course, the response time will be uh, faster and it results into higher throughput, but a large number of requests getting throttled and return as failure. So for that one, we get a very low success rate. And the more intensive the, the workload, the 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 lower the success rate. Whereas and when we introduce a workload smoother in between, we can see that response time is lower a little bit and lower throughput, but we can um, queue the re excessive request. So all get re uh, processed and return as uh, success. So we have a high success rate. So the idea of this uh, RQ2 is we would like to uh, uh, give a suggestion that uh, maybe cloud provider should uh, implement the workload smoother implicitly from their end uh, so that in case that the workload become like big, uh, that will be handled uh, accordingly. So it's not really returned as the success, um, low success rate. And that has come to the end of uh, my, my quick presentation. Uh, so for more details, um, please refer to the paper and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Kim. So yeah, we have a couple of minutes for questions. Yeah, Philip, go ahead. Uh, Andre has a question before me. <laughs> oh, really? I was going up Just and down. Looking I saw your hand first. Maybe, maybe Andre can ask his question before me. But I think for one yes, minute. I was one. Uh, Kim, I was wondering if you, if when you look, we're looking at the different auto scaling heuristics, uh, whether you saw a link between the uh, auto scaling heuristics and the charging algorithms that are used by the the cloud providers. Uh, actually, no. Because for AWS, oh no, for for uh, for um, uh, FAAS, for the cost, yeah, you're talking about the cost, right? Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Philip, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I guess my question is, uh, so you, your your experiment mostly was on AWS Lambda and Azure Cloud Functions in isolation. Did you also do experiments where you looked at these uh, services together with external services like uh, storage services or, or, or databases or queues? Because oftentimes what we see in our research is that people don't really build entire applications on top of Lambda. They usually use them in combination with a lot of other stuff. And I was wondering whether you considered this in your experiments as well. Yes, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, so for us, uh, of course, we know that in the industry, people are not using a standalone uh, function, although it's uh, kind of uh, recommended to keep your function to do one thing. But um, to for us to evaluate the scalability and elasticity of FAAS, uh, we would, that's why we would like to formulate our uh, research to focus on the single uh, function. But in reality, if we have more uh, 
like I would say it's complicated use case where you have your function and in um, combination with other like uh, messaging and or the database uh, that will actually is a good use case to study but it will introduce uh, increase the complexity of the, the experiment because uh, we have to detect like where the bottleneck might be and uh, it might be at one of the point and set, and the th that's why we actually plan to include the more complex use case in our future research thank you for your question yeah. Okay. I, I, okay, I hope you. the results from the spec RG cloud group will help with that. <laughs> I think a lot of work in the spec RG cloud group goes into this direction of yeah. identifying where the bottleneck is. <laughs> yeah, that's a great suggestion. Yeah. Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, we are four minutes into the break. So uh, I guess uh, we still have about six minutes to stretch our legs and come back for the next session. Thank you for all the talks to the presenters. Thank you for the questions by the audience. And thank you for the lively session. We can continue uh, follow up questions on Slack. Thank you. Thank you. So I think somebody, uh, Nicholas, will share screen or something now. Uh, yeah. yeah, so the next session is the machine learning and performance session. And I think Puyan, you are the chair of this, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe you can take the reins from now, from here, and see if the sure. presenters are here and so on. And yeah, the go. presenters are here. Excellent. They okay, already shared their slides. So, Alexander, do you want to go ahead and test whether you can share your slide on the screen? Yeah, certainly. Thanks. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Awesome. Please note that after this session on machine learning for performance, we do not have a break. We directly continue with the data challenge. Sounds good. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Ashwin, do you want to also test uh, quickly? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great. We can see it. Oh. Awesome. And Danilo, if if you could also check. Daniel, are you here? Oh, yeah, sorry. What did you say? Uh, could you check uh, whether you can share your slide on the screen? Oh, yeah, sure. Thanks. Let's try. Um, should we do more here? Do you see any slides? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, perfect. We have three minutes to go. Hi, Puyan. Hey, how are you? Good. Do you mind if I, I try to share my slides as well? Because I'm yeah, sharing the session directly after. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. You should be good, right? Yeah. Looks good. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, you would expect that after teaching online for two years, it should be second nature, right? That's right. <laughs> Thanks.
Okay, maybe let's start the session. Hi everybody. Um, so this session is about machine learning and performance. Um, we have three papers, two short papers and one full industry papers. As you know, um, short paper, five minute presentation, five minute Q&A and full papers, 10 minutes presentation and five minutes Q&A. So the first paper is on machine learning based interference model in cloud native applications. Alexandro, please take it away. So everyone can see my screen, just double checking. Yes, that's good. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Baluda, and I'm from York University in Canada. Today, I'll be uh, presenting our machine learning based approach for interference modeling in cloud native applications. So software applications are frequently deployed on cloud platforms like Amazon Web Services. These cloud native applications often follow a microservice architecture. Microservices are frequently deployed in containers, which are co-located on shared virtual machines. Co-location can improve resource utilization, but it can also result in resource competition, which can cause performance degradation, uh, which we refer to as performance interference. Our proposed ML-based techniques model performance interference in cloud native applications. By modeling the impact, mitigation strategies can be employed when necessary. Our contributions to that end are static and dynamic ML-based interference modeling techniques that generalize to unknown interfering applications at runtime, have minimal model training overhead, and outperform competing state-of-the-art modeling techniques. Furthermore, we conduct a comparative analysis between the static and dynamic ML interference modeling techniques. Techniques for interference modeling are either static or dynamic. The figure presents a high level overview of our static interference technique. The target monitored application consists of multiple tiers of microservices. Interfering applications can be co-located on the same virtual machine as the target application. As seen in the figure, the technique runs in two phases. The first phase is the training phase, where controlled experiments are run to train our ML model in an offline model training fashion. Uh, the workload generator tool is used to send workload to the target application in order to generate a wide range of resource utilizations. Also, the metric monitor serves to collect the metrics of concern. With the metrics for the target application obtained, we employ an auto ML framework to train ML models. In our experimentation, we use the H2O auto ML framework. The framework outputs the best performing model from the set of models it trains. Now we move on to the second phase where the trained model is deployed to model performance interference at runtime. In the second phase, we monitor metrics of concern at runtime as the microservice serves client traffic. This data is used to invoke the ML model, which in turn predicts the application response time subject to any interference that may be present. As for our dynamic ML technique, there is only a single phase, the runtime phase. Model training and invocation are both done at runtime. The setup is largely the same as in the static modeling scenario, but we now have an additional component called the model manager. The model manager is responsible for the end-to-end -end life cycle of models trained and deployed in our runtime phase. The model manager employs a model deployment strategy as defined by a DevOps team that defines when a model should be trained. The strategy triggers the model training process when required and the newly trained model replaces the old. The model prediction process then invokes a new model to obtain at runtime performance predictions. Our dynamic ML technique utilizes a sliding window deployment strategy in conjunction with the H2O auto ML framework. Sliding window techniques configure a fixed time interval. Model training is conducted with data collected in this time interval. With a properly balanced interval, we can construct well-performing models 
while also minimizing required model training time. Uh, so by utilizing a sliding window for model training and deployment, changes in the cloud environment can be captured in a dynamic fashion. Here I present uh, an overview of our results with additional discussion in the extended version of this presentation. To evaluate our techniques, we ran a set of experiments in the AWS cloud. We leveraged several microservices as our target in interfering applications and co-located them on virtual machines. And we sent varying workloads to these co-located applications, monitored metrics of concern, and used those metrics to evaluate our interference modeling techniques versus competing techniques. To that end, we use the mean absolute percentage error as the evaluation metric. Competing techniques were the layered queuing model, linear regression, and the Gaussian process model. As you can see in the graphs, both our static and dynamic techniques outperformed competing techniques in several cases by wide margin. In the dynamic interference modeling case, our technique outperforms by at least 1.45% and at most 92.04% across the various scenarios. For future work, we intend to integrate our performance interference technique with uh, microservice placement strategies. Quantifying the potential impact of microservice co-location provides a meaningful signal to drive suitable microservice placement. And so this marks the end of my presentation. Thank you to all listening. Uh, are there any questions? Thanks, Alexandra. Is there any question? Please raise your hand or unmute and ask your question. Uh, I have a quick question, Alexandra. Um, what is your thoughts about um, like um, some uh, some theories like extreme value uh, theory, which have been used? Uh, previously to, um, to understand uh, interference, performance interference. How, how do you contrast your approach with, with uh, prior theories? Yeah, so, so our, our approach, especially given it's auto ML, um, it's really meant to be uh, pretty hands-off or not require uh, all that much theory or depth for the practitioner, um, especially considering you know some some devops teams uh well they won't have the same level of uh, knowledge on the various modeling strategies um that's i think that's the big piece here just trying to make it as hands off the wheel so to speak yeah that makes sense thanks more do you want to go ahead on <clears throat> alex I may have missed something, but how did you measure the uh, the, the error? I, what, what sort of set of cases did you mm -hmm. use? I mean, you're using, presumably predicting something in a, in a situation with your model and then comparing it. How did you generate those predictive cases? Um, yeah, so uh, for our experimentation, we measured the response time of our target application, the microservice Acme Air. and uh, we, we evaluated the model's predicted response time subject to performance interference versus what realized the true value. Ah, so, okay. So you looked at a model that took into account interference and a model that didn't take into account interference. Is that right? And, and how uh, those two models compared? So, so we have the true, the baseline response times. Yeah. Uh, subject to interference, and then the model that predicts uh, the same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then compared. Yeah. Yeah. Hank, um, please unmute and ask. I, I can ask. Uh, so, uh, is there any rule to determine whether you want to retrain your model or just uh, retrain it regularly? What's the strategy? Yeah, so the strategy we uh, use and some prior works have used, uh, essentially every 30 seconds, we retrain a model. So it's a sliding window. Um, but certainly, you know, uh, the deployment, the model deployment strategy itself could incorporate some additional logic. Um, mm -hmm. You can imagine at points in time, the workload may not change significantly. And 
retraining a model might not change anything all that much. Yeah. Um, so certainly there's further work that could be, you know, done on the deployment strategy itself. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, Ashwin, do you want to take it away? Let's start. Yeah. Thanks, Alexander. Thank you. Uh, hope I'm audible, right? And the screen is visible. Yes, it's great. I'm Ashwin Krishnan from TCS Research Mumbai. I'll be presenting on performance model and profile guarded design of a high performance session based recommendation engine. This paper is co authored with Manoj Dupur and Sana. Now, starting with a quick introduction to recommendation model. So, recommendation models are systems that try to target the right product to the right audience. For example, when you visit a site like Amazon, you see a lot of products being highlighted or being advertised to you based on your previous interaction with the website. So this essentially is a job of a recommendation model. Now there are various types of recommendation models in the market. One such model is a session-based recommendation model that tries to predict the next item or next set of top K items to a user, uh, which the user is most likely to click or view next based on an anonymous session. Here the user's profile is not available. So all the recommendation system has is a session with series of item clicks or views. So based on that information, the model tries to predict the next item or next set of top K item the user is most likely to click or view next. So giving a high level architectural background for a session based recommendation model, the input to the system is a session which has a series of item clicks or views that goes to a GNN layer that captures complex transitions between the items, followed by a position embedding layer that incorporates sequential information between the various items in that session, which goes to an attention layer to incorporate global and recent preferences of a user in that session. Now the output is again, a item or set of top K items that the user is most likely to click or view next. Here, the uh, output of this, uh, Attention layer is session embedding, which is the representation of an item the user is most likely to click or view next, where any embedding is just an n dimension representation of the item in the entire system. So, our objective is to provide a high speed inference architecture comprising of either a CPU, GPU, or an FPGA for a session based recommendation model. We initially tested a nicer model, which is developed by uh, TCS and is a, one of the best ranked uh, session-based recommendation model in the market with an MR at 20 of 18.72 uh, uh, and we call it 20 of 53.39 for a Digenetica data set. Now we found that for real-time inference, the overall latency is around 2.36 milliseconds and with a throughput of 423 uh, inferences per second. We found that with increase in batch, the throughput increase. For example, for the batch of 2048, the overall uh, overall throughput was 76, around 7600 inferences per second. But here in the uh, for session based recommendation model, a real time inference is of utmost importance, where we immediately infer or recommend the item or top items for a user and immediately be prepared for the next site, or the next user income, or next user arrival. But during any sales or during rush hour, thousands of users may potentially come uh, concurrently. So there is a need for high throughput as well, where we could batch smartly and send the entire session or set of sessions together. So we felt we need an accelerator to provide high throughput and low latency like architecture for session-based recommendation model. The obvious choice was a GPU because the uh, libraries like PyTorch and TensorFlow, they help, they make our life easy. So just with addition of a couple of commands, we could pull the entire model onto a GPU. But again, we found that for lower batch, the performance of GPU was not up to the mark. It was hardly 182 inferences per second for real-time inference. And a couple of layers like graph creation and position embedding layer were a bottleneck, whereas graph creation has operations like matrix concatenation, transpose, and random memory accesses. Here we created all the NumPy arrays and Python lists as PyTorch tensors, and then we ported it onto the GPU, which was not a very optimal way of doing it. Uh, here, where because the majority of the time was consumed in various CPU activities like maybe CUDA mem copy operations and other CUDA API calls. 
So we felt there are either two options, either go with a custom fine tuning on uh, GPU using maybe CUDA or try out a different kind of an accelerator. Now, FPGA is one such accelerator. It, it is a reconfigurable in nature, which has thousands of lookup tables, DSP processors, and on-chip memories like block RAM and registers. And all of them are reconfigurable in nature, which enables a greater depth of pipeline. Also, the state-of-the-art FPGA boards or recent FPGA boards come with HBM memories, where you have multiple banks, and each of these banks would be addressed independently. So, suppose I am going, I am to uh, distribute multiple embedding across different banks of an HBM. I could randomly, I could pick multiple random embedding simultaneously using different banks and have a very high throughput which is in contrast to a GPU that needs streamlined memory access. So we felt there's a huge potential to accelerate neural networks, embedding fetch operations, and even the graph creation like uh, operations. But on the downside, there's a lot of effort in designing and testing an FPGA. For example, you may completely design an F model onto the FPGA, but you find that the performance is not optimal. So the entire effort goes into vain. So there was a need to come up with a modeling technique which we came up with. So in the interest of time, I won't be discussing the modeling technique in the details, but I encourage you to kindly go to our paper or even the ICT YouTube channel. So just to summarize the modeling strategy, the very first step is to record the number of clock cycles or resource utilization for each of the floating point operations, like floating point multiplication, division, addition, and so on. And the then the innermost loop of any matrix multiplication, which usually comprises of three different loops, to be completely undoed. That is, the inner, the, all the operations in the innermost loop will be implemented in parallel. And all the dependent operations in ML, are like uh, in most of the ML equations, like bias addition, sigmoid, tan H, are to be pipelined within that innermost loop. And the output of each layer to be stored on the block RAM with necessary pipe, necessary partitions so that you could retrieve n elements in parallel. Then one important point to note is to keep the overall resource utilization to be less than the 70% of total available resource. This is done to avoid routing congestion that may happen at high resource utilization and deteriorate your performance because it limits the overall operating frequency. If you find uh, over utilization, one thumb rule is to reuse the resource within an individual layer. So using the strategy, we estimated the performance of different individual layers on an FPGA and found that the scoring layer in particular, which has a dense operation, is the bottleneck layer on FPGA because its throughput is, it limits the overall throughput of the system. Now, one observation is that different layer performs differently on different kinds of hardware. For example, also on top of that architecture like CPU and GP perform better with batch size, which again depends on the incoming workload. So based on this uh, measured uh, uh, measured uh, value on CPU and GPU and the estimated performance on FPGA, we came up with various deployment options. And one such example is at the batch of 2048, where we find the option one to be the best with the graph creation and the position embedding layer being implemented on the FPGA, rest of the layers being implemented on the GPU, assuming there is only one instance of the each layer. Here on the downside, option one has multiple hops. Whereas in option two, there's only one hop, but again, we need a system with two accelerators like FPGA and GP. And in option three and option four, although it limits the throughput, but we only need a single accelerator. So there is a trade-off between the cost and the accelerator. Now we tested our hypothesis on option three, where the scoring layer being the bottleneck layer on the FPGA being implemented on the CPU and the rest of the layers on the, uh, FPGA. And we found that our measured results closely, our experimental results closely match with our modeling. And to establish communication between CPU and the FPGA, we use OpenCL library with white, Xilinx YTS uh, 2019 as the tool to do our experiments. Now, what we found was for a real time inference, the F, F, uh, FPGA CPU based hybrid architecture gave a speed up of 6.1x compared to baseline CPU, 14.2x compared to a baseline uh, GPU, and 6.1x compared to a CG implementation, where CG implementation is uh, graph creation being implemented on CPU and the rest of the layers on the GPU. So 
here one thing is that for every kernel launch that is for every session arrival there was an added overall overhead latency that limited our throughput but if we have to batch multiple sessions we were able to hide the overall latency and achieve a throughput of almost 33000 uh, instances per second which was the estimated throughput uh, for the option 3 at batch of 2048 uh, that was a thing if you batch it you will be able to hide the overall latency in uh, in our case then to summarize everything we developed a modeling strategy to estimate the performance of different layers of an SBR on an FPGA, although we tested for a nicer like system, but this could be generalized for other SBRs as well. And we found that the heterogeneous kind of an architecture is most suitable for session-based recommendation in, uh, inference, which we experimentally proved using an FPGA CPU-based hybrid architecture to achieve a very high performance. And thank you so much for listening um, in for like questions. Thanks, Aspin. Uh, great work. Um, please ask your question. Unmute yourself or raise your hand. I have a quick question. Um, so, um, so for um, inference, especially recommender system, um, the the main bottleneck is is this embedding uh, table, which could be huge essentially and um, I mean, in computer architecture community, people have explored uh, potential for performance improvement. Uh, I was wondering, what is your thoughts uh, in terms of uh, in-memory architectures, uh, especially uh, due to this um, closer, uh, like making a memory closer to CPU, um, and how do you contrast it with, with your approach? Yeah. Actually, that's a good question. I mean, there are prior words that talks on improving the uh, embedding fetch operation for a session for a normal recommendation system. Now, uh, that the most of the works are related to a conventional click through rate recommendation systems where you will have multiple embedding tables, and again, they will be huge in volume. So, the again, the architecture is slightly different to the session based recommendation system, which has only one embedding uh, table. So here the requirement is slightly different in the sense we need to fetch 10 items or at most 10 items for a single session. Whereas for other recommender systems, you will have 40 to maybe even hundreds of uh, tables, depending on like Facebook DLRM has up to 40 uh, to 10 embedding tables there. So the work is extensively being there in that part for a conventional recommendation model. People have used technologies like PIM and again, FPGAs have been used to uh, distribute multiple embedding tables. But in this case, being the architecture is different, plus session-based recommendation model has multiple heterogeneous layers as well, different kinds of layer. For example, GNN is there, attention is there, scoring layer. Uh, the, such kind of complexity is not present in other kind of conventional recommendation model. So this is something different that we have attacked on to tackle different layers and embedding layer, not a big bottleneck for session-based recommendation model in our case. Thanks. Any question? Uh, one one more question from me. Um, like, uh, have you tested with uh, multi uh, kind of multi model and multi modality? Uh, uh, deployment scenario uh, and, and have you done any sensitivity analysis when, when you increase the uh, the number of models in recommendation system like you mentioned about DLRM specifically it allows to to have multiple models uh, right uh, what is your thoughts do you have any experimental results so uh, that part is something which we haven't done yet uh, that will be treated as a feature. Okay, sounds good. Okay, um, if there is no question, we can move on to the next uh, presentation. Um, thanks. Uh, Danilo, uh, do you want to go ahead and start? Yes. Okay, so am I audible and can everyone see this? Yes, that's great, thanks. Okay. Oh, thanks. Um, 
Okay, thanks first of all for organizing the event and also thanks for inviting us. Uh, today I want to talk about our recent work that analyzed the computational cost of reinforcement learning for game engines through a high case study, which was also actually the topic for my bachelor's thesis. And this work was done in collaboration with Duncan Kampert from SURF, as well as with Ana Lucia Fabonescu from the University of Amsterdam. So to start, I would like to provide you with some background knowledge about game playing engines. So utilizing computers to play board games has been a topic of research for many decades. And traditional approaches incorporate heuristics with the goal of replicating the decision-making of expert level human players. Although traditional approaches have been successful in a wide variety of games, they heavily rely on the creation of heuristics. And despite decades of work to create such heuristics, there are main games for which the best engines are only able to play at the level of human amateurs. But this all changed in 2016 when DeepMind introduced Alpha Zero. And in contrast to traditional engines, Alpha Zero is only provided with the rules of the game, so no heuristics, and instead learns to play the game by playing many games against itself. So you could see this if Alpha Zero is sort of learning these heuristics by practicing instead of the user providing it to it. Um, and so consequently, it would seem that um, any engine for any game can be built in this way. But unfortunately, the efficiency of this Alpha Zero approach remains largely unknown as it comes at a significant price in terms of compute resources. Specifically, researchers often employ a trial and error approach to find the best possible configuration. Um, however, because it's often non-trivial to tune the high parameters as well as the encoding options, this will result in many trial and errors. And um, to increase efficiency, we need optimizations. For instance, we can add more human knowledge to reduce the size of the design space, improve the modeling itself, but most importantly, we can improve the training speed. In our work, we study the efficiency of Alpha Zero's approach through a case study for the game of Hive. And to that end, our ultimate goal is to find a strong implementation for the game of Hive that is based on Alpha Zero's approach, which we'll call Alpha Zero Hive or AZ Hive for short. Although Alpha Zero's approach does not require us to provide any heuristics to the engine, it does require us to encode game-specific components in a very clever way. Furthermore, how we encode such game-specific components has great consequences on both the design as well as the overall performance of the resulting engine. To systematically analyze the different encoding options, we propose a multidimensional design space. And uh, every uh, whose dimension, there's like multiple dimensions here. And if you have a same configuration, you can think of that as a point in this design space. And the dimensions can be anything from the board representation to be fed into the neural network to optimizations, both in terms of efficiency as well as in energy consumption. But what is important here is that the size of this design space explodes exponentially with the number of design choices that we can make. To give a more concrete example, for the design space that we proposed, the first three dimensions of the design space already span 60 unique configurations. And this number will only become larger as we add more and more dimensions to the design space. In search for a strong Hive implementation, <clears throat> we empirically evaluated a subset of the design space. And to that end specifically, we uh, to analyze the impact of the board representation on the overall playing strength of the engine, we compare different Alpha Zero Hive instances, which each employ a different board representation while keeping the other dimensions of the design space fixed. And to that end, we train each of those instances for four hours in total, and throughout training, regularly pit each of them against an agent that plays uh, moves at random to see how it progresses. Our results indicate that even though some engines definitely seem to improve over time, others seem to either not improve at all or even get worse over time. Uh, furthermore, even though we keep most of the design space dimensions fixed, uh, the the performance of such configurations is very unpredictable. And to generate this plot, even though that um, this is only about five different configurations in this huge design space, generating this plot all alone already took us 100 GPU hours. And this brings me to our evaluation on the computational cost of exploring the design space. And as I've mentioned before, exploration of the design space is necessary to find the best possible configurations. However, because in a game as complex as Hive, there is no rules to discern between good and bad design choices, exploration ultimately means that we have to try all possible configurations, which in turn is extremely compute intensive. To make this a bit more concrete, for the full exploration of the design space that we proposed, 
we estimate the computational cost of this exploration, and we found it to be about 381 node years, which in energy is equivalent to roughly 600 megawatt hours. This is enough energy to provide about 100 Dutch citizens of energy for a whole year. So to conclude, um, we've assessed the computational cost that is required for adapting AlphaZero's approach to a complex game such as Hive, for which it hasn't been done before. However, both because of the incredible size of the design space, as well as the unpredictability of the performance of the different configurations, um, the cost of exploring the design space can quickly become prohibitive. So with that, I want to conclude this talk. And um, thank you for listening. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thanks. Thanks, Danilo. Great presentation. Um, is there any question? So I have a, I have a short one. Um, so basically, uh, interesting enough, we, we, we did similar work, um, but but for time series data, basically to 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 a composition with time series data. Um, did you use the experience based tree search that uh, AlphaZero uses, or did you um, get around that somehow? Uh, yeah, so I think you're talking about Monte Carlo tree search, if I'm not mistaken, yes, right? Yes. Yeah, so we did use that, but um, because we have five minutes, like I have many backup slides, but we haven't had time to talk about this uh, Monte Carlo tree search. So indeed, uh, the whole idea of Alpha Zero is that it basically combines these two components. So on the one hand, you have this neural network, which takes in some board state, and then it produces two things, namely a policy factor that describes which moves are good by providing some sort of probability distribution vector. And it also outputs a value between minus one and one. And then the idea of Monte Carlo tree search is to basically find promising moves by exploring a so-called game tree whose nodes are these game states and whose edges are moves that transition one game state to another. And then the idea is that with Monte Carlo tree search, we can uh, output an improved policy factor, which in general is much stronger than this policy factor that is output by the neural network. And then the idea is to optimize the neural network to make this policy factor more similar to this policy factor output by Monte Carlo tree search. So yeah, indeed, short answer, we did use Monte Carlo tree search and uh, yeah, this is what it's used for. Maybe maybe as a follow-up, if nobody else has a question, but I, I was uh, kind of confused a bit by the message because he said it, it costs, definitely it costs us also a lot of uh, computing time. But as far as I see, this is uh, one of the good ways to go because once you have several configurations, right, you can use the machine learning to, to predict basically the best uh, tree path there uh, for, for any configuration output, no? Do, yeah, so, do I understand it correctly? Yeah, so basically the message is as follows. So indeed, once you have a good engine, it's perfect, so it just works. But the main message is that finding this good engine, because there's like so many things you can tune about Alpha Zero, and for every game it's different, basically, uh, how you encode the game, how you encode the action. So for instance, we had to come up with some sort of encoding of the different action that's, that are possible, such that we can encode it into a vector, such that the end component of this vector corresponds to some move with the action encoding that has the same integer. And because you have so many different things to tune, um, it's really hard to find a good configuration that works well. So um, the computation, okay. of course, that comes with finding a good configuration is, is like the thing that takes a lot of work. We've actually found out that uh, putting, uh, spending time on uh, packing your data into images because this is what AlphaZero does best, or works with best was the best approach actually. So letting Google handle all the, the, the heavy lifting and we just uh, focused on an engine to transform our time series data into images and then it worked really good. So maybe, yes. yeah. maybe you can check this out. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Thanks for the suggestion and uh, yeah, no problem. Thanks Mark for good questions. Um, is there any other questions? We have two more minutes. I have a quick question. Uh, like Derb works on uh, area of design and space explorations. Uh, how your work is, is uh, relevant to this area? Sorry, could you repeat the question? I don't think I uh, How it. your work is, uh, you, you contrast your work uh, in like the area of design and space explorations. Yeah. Uh, different communities, obviously, from the architecture, uh, like systems, etc. Yeah, so, so it's not really usual to formalize the alpha zero or anything 
like it's not really that usual that deep learning or any officer approach is formalized this way but we thought that it was actually a good way to think about finding this configuration so uh, one thing about alpha zero is uh, don't get me wrong i think it's a really nice paper but they don't really pay much attention to the process that came with um like finding this best optimal configuration so they only present what worked really good but they never mentioned like it took them like two years to find this configuration and they never really zoom into or specify or discuss anything about how they came up with it uh, with that uh, best configuration so that's what we try and to look into a little bit more is to actually go deeper into the process that comes with finding this good uh, configuration and that's that's in that sense we try to formalize it in as a, like a design space exploration problem mm -hmm. thanks yeah. um, i think that concludes the session uh and uh corpo thank you very Thank you very much, Poyan. So hi, everybody. Great to see you. Let me just share my screen. Uh, here we go. So you should be able to see my slides. So we've seen a lot of great talks so far at ISP, like usual. Um, in this next section, we're going, we're going to do something new. So we're going to um, present the data challenge track papers. So this is a new track this year. Uh, <clears throat> this, um, it was uh, chaired by me. I'm from Corporal Basemer from the University of Alberta. Uh, it was also chaired by David uh, Daly from MongoDB and uh, Wei Shang from Concordia University. And like I said, this is the first time to have this track. Uh, it was inspired by some of the very successful data challenge tracks at other conferences. So, uh, for example, the Mining Software Repositories or MSR conferences has this uh, for many years and it's been very successful. So, so why do we need this, this data challenge? Well, as you know, as a performance engineer uh, or a performance engineer researcher, we come across lots and lots of data, right? And we already uh, have a lot of questions of whether data can be shared or data can be made open. Um, so one of the challenges that we, that we come across with this data is that um, it's often difficult to find data about large scale industry projects, right? So lots of these uh, research studies are done on open source projects, but not on the actual industry projects. And, what we do in the data challenge is that um, we provide a data set uh, as the track chairs. And then the goal of the track is to do something cool with the data, right? So basically, this, this performance data um, is published. And then the track is basically, um, you want to do anything cool with the data. So this can be a statistical analysis. This can be some kind of new visualization technique. Uh, this can be to build a tool to detect anomalies, for example. And then you write a four-page paper about it. Okay, so that's it's, it's a very open-ended track. Um, the nice thing is that the data is now published, so you can also use it for future, future papers, so not only for this track, uh, if you want to do more uh, thorough studies. Um, so <clears throat> David will give you a quick idea of what's in this year's data set and what MongoDB has been doing with this. Thanks, Corporal. Um, yeah, so we at MongoDB, we run performance tests regularly, some multiple times a day, some um, once a day, some uh, less regularly, but we run performance tests in our CI system uh, and they report results. Uh, and so the data set is the results from running our performance tests for the last several years um, and the analysis that we've run on it. Uh, next, maybe. Let's see. And, you know, so at MongoDB, uh, I mean, we're really excited about this challenge and everything that's happened from it. Um, understanding the performance of our software is, is really important to delivering on our mission. It's really hard to uh, enable people to uh, uh, create, transform, and disrupt industries if their database is, is slow or unresponsive. So we've invested a lot of uh, time and effort into our performance infrastructure, and we always want to make it better. Uh, we want to take advantage of the great work from the academic community and, and help uh, the community advance the state of the art. And, and oftentimes the hard part of that is proving that something is useful, that's a good idea and we should implement it in our system. Um, we always have a lot to do and it's hard to prioritize that proof of concept work. So opening up our data this way, we let the authors do the proof of the proof work and it makes it a lot easier for us to pick up and use their ideas. And so already from this project, we're able to um, 
share the papers uh, ahead of time inside the company uh, where there's been a lot of excitement about it and we're already picking up ideas from the papers and putting them into uh, projects that are in flight. And, and to echo Corpal, like the data is an artifact, it's out there. I hope that uh, it's been incredibly useful from these four papers, but I hope that it continues to be used by people uh, in their research going forward. Okay, thank you, David. So this year for the data challenge trip, we had four accepted papers. So here you see the titles um, and we'll go through them. Everyone will get a five minute presentation and there will be the opportunity to ask some questions as well. So we're very hopeful that um, after the success of this year, next year, there will be another data challenge track with a new data set. Uh, so if you're interested in, in running this track or you, you have a data set that you think will be useful for this track, um, don't hesitate to reach out to one of the, the, the track chairs and they will uh, connect you to the right people to discuss this. So uh, finally, I would like to thank again, uh, MongoDB for sponsoring this year's data set. I hope they get a lot of views out of uh, what we're doing with the data. And then we can start with the talk. So the first talk uh, will be by Andre Bauer. So I'll just stop sharing my screen. So Andre, can you please go ahead and share your screen? Perfect. Yes, thank you. Please go ahead. You're muted, Andre. You're muted. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you for this hint. I don't know why I was muted, but yeah. Um, yeah, so I want to present today our solution or our um, contribution to the data challenge that was hosted by MongoDB. I will make a short motivation. We heard a lot, a lot of things, but I try to recap it. So DevOps, we have DevOps principle today offers us a lot of different benefits, like a faster deployment of our application, improvement in product quality, and many more. And one of the essential parts of the, um, DevOps is performance regression testing. And because, for example, performance is seen as a quality attribute and changes in performance are of special interest because if the change is negative, the rollout of a version might be stopped. And as we heard before, MongoDB is a pioneer in the area of performance regression testing and they automatically detect the change points, but they have a human who is sitting and observes or, or triage the potential change points, either in false positives or true positives. And that means this creates a delay in the testing pipeline and introduce further costs. So our idea was to classify and detect change points automatically. And how did we do this? Yeah, we were comparing time series before and after a potential change point. Uh, so at commit, and we described a time series with features here depicted as a symbol with a standard deviation. And then we used a machine learning method on these features to classify the potential change points. And what we did exactly was first to develop a model that can classify the potential change points then we evaluate the performance of different machine learning models based on the predictable data set of MongoDB. And then we applied the resulting model to the unable data set of MongoDB. So the main idea is here for each change point, we extracted two subtime series called pre and after. Pre starts usually either at the beginning of a time series or after the last confirmed change point. And after starts always after the commit of interest until the next confirmed um, change point. And then we transform each subtime series from a time to a feature domain. We did so because if you look at the time domain, all these time series have different lengths and it, this makes it hard to put it in a machine learning model. So we transform the data from a time domain to a feature domain to have always a um, feature vector which describes the time series with equal length. And we have several features that are depicted here. I won't go in detail, everything is written in the paper. And what we did then is we trained the machine learning models and we only used the time series was contained to change points to have the ground truth. 
and we calculate the features from a pre and after time series. And the label was either false positive or true positive, that was done by MongoDB. And then we evaluated our models, and here we split the data on 80% training and 20% test, and we did 100 random splits. Here are the results, and we see that random forest was on all metrics that we considered the best. And then we wanted to go a step further from classification to detection. And here the idea is for each new commit, we calculated the features on the past commits and calculated the features for the current commit. That means after is now only one point instead of um, any length like before. So it's only the current commits. And then we classify this commit based on these features with a pre-trained model. We tested this on a whole data set that was around about 22 million comets. And here we have an ROC of 29% and an accuracy of 84.3% accuracy. We tested this on the labeled data set. And we found in addition 690,000 change points that were not labeled yet. To sum up, MongoDB relies on human power to triage with potential change points. And our solution has a classification IOC of 98.5% and detection IOC of 92%. We uploaded our approach and the data sets and all marked points on a GitHub repo. And before ending the presentation, I want also to give some critical force. Of course, our method relies on the labeling of MongoDB. That means it may be prone to errors and it is tailored to data sets what is provided by MongoDB, but it can be easily adapted because the only thing I have to do is to train my random forest method on another data set and the same methodology can be used. Yeah, that's all. I'm happy to questions. Thank you very much, Andre, for a very interesting talk. Are there any questions? So what people think about is, I have a question. So you you identified almost 700,000 unlabeled change points. Mm -hmm. yes. So it, 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 in practice, how do you recommend that, that MongoDB or any company deals with such a number of, of identified performance issues? <laughs> it's a good question. Um, I was also, um, let's say, surprised that so many, that our approach found so many points. And of course, there may be some false positives so in the end a human has to, again to verify it because i cannot go through with 700,000 points but it was for me hard to see even with the label points what is a change point what not therefore i'm trusting that the model learned well on the pre-labeled data set and that we have a high confidence in the font um, points and in the terms of performance i it's hard to me to say how a company should deal with it therefore i have two less um, experience I, with this work, I tried only to give and support, not to give any um, explanation about the data that's for the experts. Okay, thank you. I see that Hein has a question. Hein, please go ahead. I, I, thanks for a great work. So I want to ask a question. Like, uh, I, I think uh, the, the change, the, this is a very uh, great data set. And uh, so I, I want to ask uh, uh, maybe a clarified question. How, so how do you like, uh, so what is the process to uh, verify that this, this change points actually they are, uh, I mean, they are valid to change, change points in, the, in, the, in, 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 your, in your like application scenario? I'm not sure if I get the question right, can you please? I, I mean, so what is a, what is a process uh, like uh, to verify that these change points are actual change points uh, for your how to determine it is a change point in your data set? You mean how we did this um, labeling or? Yeah, labeling, yeah, labeling, yeah. Yeah, so. The ground um, truth, maybe, yeah. Maybe yeah. I was too fast. We trained the machine learning model before on the label data set. So he knows, okay, if I have, for example, these different features, this is a change point or not. And when I feed the information of unlabeled data inside with a also with different features and then based on the knowledge before it labeled the data now. So the idea is that the data on the whole data sets, the distribution is similar to the labeled one. And therefore I can transfer the knowledge from the labeled one to the unlabeled part of the data. 
but the question yeah. that uh, yeah. Heng is asking, I guess, how you validate that? Uh, I yeah. um, that's I cannot validate. That's the problem. I can only validate the um, points that were already labeled by MongoDB. On this, we has this twenty nine percent accuracy. Uh, I will see, and when we perform this by this per commit base, and here we could only validate the found ones, so already labeled ones, because we were going. Also using this because here we got like step by step, not like this varying horizon. And here we got uh, validated, and we were here a bit worse because we only look at one point instead of a whole time series. And so we could only verify it on the data set or a part of the data set what was um, already verified by MongoDB. So I have a kind of internal validation for the found ones, but I cannot for whole approach, but we have a, a still 90% something on this by this stepwise approach. So I hope that the data distribution is not changing that much and therefore the um, results are transferable. So I think this, this is a really interesting discussion and a really important one actually, because it applies to, to, to many of these, these types of approaches, right? And, uh, so I, in the interest of time, I encourage you to, to continue this discussion on the Slack channel. Yeah, uh, because I think there are lot, lots of op open questions there. So if you have any additional questions for Andre, please address them there. And uh, thank you again, Andre, for the presentation. And I would like to proceed to the, the, the second talk, which is by Shin Shen on characterizing and triaging tra change points. So Shi, can you please share your screen? Yes, we can see your screen. I just cannot hear you, so you're still muted. Hi, uh, hello everyone, can you hear me? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm Jie Chen from Hangzhou Dianzi University. Um, so what we presented here is about characterizing and uh, tracking change points, just uh, similar as the previous one. Uh, Based on the large amount of historical performance test data, many statical models have been developed for change point detection. So such as MongoDB um, do the performance test with evergreen and detect the change points automatically. Uh, then software teams must manually inspect these change points to determine if it is a real change worthy for uh, investigation or it is, uh, uh, it is significant or it, if it is just uh, some noise. So among those detected change points, we found that about 44% of the charged uh, change points as two positive change points. Um, so uh, we think that the first um, first positive ones will waste the developers' time to uh, require them double check those code. So the goal of, uh, of our work is uh, um, to characterize them and uh, charging them. First, we um, to help us uh, the understanding of those change points. We experimentally characterize those change points using uh, 31 filters and demonstrate whether they can distinguish the two positive ones and the fourth positive ones. Then we will propose, uh, use this, those proposed filters to develop and machine learning models to, uh, to do the class, um, classification um, automatically. Uh, here is our uh, futures and uh, some um, quality, um, qualitative analyzed results. We select the filters from three domains. Uh, the first one is about the time series related futures. Uh, in those data set, every um, performance test will be, uh, have a uh, unique configuration. So here we assume that the change point with different configurations should be treated differently. Here we found that the majority of those kind of filters can differ um, can different significantly from the um, two parts um, two positive ones and the false positive ones, especially the number of the threads uh, shows a significant difference. In detail, the number of the uh, threads for the two positive ones is much larger than the false positive ones. This means that additional attention should be paid to the uh, performance test that run with more threads. 
uh, and uh, second one we consider the execution result for those change points. However, we found that uh, um, those features uh, that measure the uh, magnetic to the of the change points do not uh, show the significant difference. So we think the additional scenario should be considered. We found that the number of linked build failures is significantly larger for the true, um, true positive ones. And additionally, we found that the filters to check the changes made um, to the previous versions of the same time series, such as if it is recently changed or if it has a higher change rate, um, the, um, those filters should be most uh, related. And uh, thirdly, um, we employ filters to describe the evolution history of the changed files uh, in each change point. As it is known that uh, most uh, versions will involve changes in multiply files, so we defined a correlation scores to describe the confidence of an associated rules between a time series and a source file. The result shows that if the change files uh, has higher correlation to the time series, the change tends to be a real one. Then secondly, we um, we use the proposed futures and the machine learning models to find if it is uh, it can <coughs> charge the change points automatically. And our result shows that <coughs> uh, by inspecting a mere of 15% percent of the change point predicted by our model, about half of the um, total change uh, to positive ones uh, can be received retrieved and uh, uh, if we can <coughs> inspect a, uh, a mere of 35% of those methods um, provide, um, predicted by our model, about 80% uh, of those um, true positive ones can be received. Uh, and also uh, we studied uh, the importance for each futures and we can see that uh, the most important one is the build feelings. Only with these futures we can <coughs> access the ACU about 89%. Uh, so um, that's our work, thanks. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. Are there any questions? So I do have a question. So how do you recommend that MongoDB would apply this, this knowledge and practice? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, uh, I think uh, uh, first uh, the characterization should be most useful. Uh, we have studied uh, the filters from uh, such as the process filters and the uh, file of those commits. So, um, and, and we have found that they, uh, they are significantly different between those two kinds of change points. So uh, I think uh, uh, we, if possible, uh, MongoDB de developers can uh, check if uh, when they do the decisions, if they have considered, uh, considered those filters or some uh, similar scenarios. Okay, thank you very much. So since we're running a, a little bit late on schedule, I, I encourage all the other questions uh, to, to, to the discussion on Slack, please. I thank you again, Chi, for your, your interesting talk. So then I would like to continue to the next speaker, which is Mark Lesnick. Thank you, Gopal. So uh, I think it's, it's great that uh... Uh, a lot of a lot has been said about the data because I don't have to say a lot a lot to say about the data, so I'm not going to repeat myself. And I also don't have a nice book to motivate it, so I'll just get going. So basically, um, we've already talked about the the um, the, the identif uh, identifying the commits for that are um, basically responsible for performance regression, and this was done through manual inspection and threshold based system. And we also had the talk last year uh, that David uh, talk, uh, talked about the system in length. So I also encourage you to check out his work and. Um, so um, I'm, I'm going to be pretty quick here and we're going to present our uh, change point detection, which is based in part on, on, on things that Andre also presented, but also shows uh, how our, our uh, work in the uh, spec research group uh, actually led to, led to this. And so we, 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 look, we looked at the time series features of the 
of the data that we had at hand. Um, then we applied a voting system. We applied a, the performalist, um, uh, the performalist um, API, which which is uh, provided by Capital One, which is a pretty big bank in the US. We, we don't know it here in Europe, but apparently they're, they're quite big. And then we, what we do is we use XGBoost to achieve, uh, basically we throw all of this together in XGBoost to achieve a 83% accuracy in our change point detection. Um, so basically the, the time series features, um, this, is, uh, this is what Andre already showed you before. So we looked at the mean, we looked at the standard deviation first, alpha and beta, and this is done. Um, uh, so we, we, we look at this before and after the change point uh, to basically categorize how the, the system behaves before and after the change point has occurred. And we then perform statistical analysis on, on the classified and misclassified uh, change points. So the, the true falses and, uh, and so on. And um, what we also do is we measure the, the change point across different projects. And here, what we've seen is that basically they, uh, interestingly enough, perform quite similar apart from, from, from one, uh, one exception. So this is also quite interesting in, in a sense of uh, how the, the, the systems behave in, in different projects and how a change point, um, uh, how a change point behavior is, is, is observed through, through different, uh, through, through different uh, projects in, in the MongoDB commits, which of course then uh, in a sense speaks to generalizability, uh, which is uh, very important. Um, so uh, what we have as a system is, is a quite uh, interesting case, in my opinion, for ensembling uh, uh, these this things. And, and this is also why it might be an easy application or an easy fix uh, in the Mongo ecosystem. So basically, we've already talked about uh, the, the time series extraction uh, of the feature before and after the change points and, and, and those features that we calculate using the standard deviation mean and so on. And what we then basically do is we apply this, uh, this, this multi-voting approach uh, to predict if, based on those features, this might be a change point or not. Um, and what we then do in parallel um, is basically with the, we, use, we use the same data, the same annotated data, and we apply the performalist, uh, the performalist API, which uh, we also, of course, encourage you to use, which is uh, it's, uh, available in, in Python code for everyone to use. And we uh, do the same thing and try to detect the, the, the annotated, uh, the detected, the annotated, <coughs> sorry, the annotated change points that are the ground truth using the performalist, uh, the performalist uh, API. And what we've also seen is that we uh, found uh, much more uh, uh, non-annotated um, change points, which of course uh, is quite difficult to verify, but still uh, it's, it's worth exploring, I'm guessing. And what we then do is we combine those two together using XGBoost, uh, which uh, for the results yields us a uh, much better performance. You can see here, uh, if, if we only use, uh, apply the, apply the um, systems as there is, and you can uh, definitely see the, the improvement that, that can be uh, made here, or that can be uh, uh, well, the, the resulting improvement when using this, this ensembling of the voting the performance, so basically a change point detection off the shelf, more let's say more or less change point detection together with then thrown into XG boost. And I think the the, the most important part here is that uh, first of all, this is a, this is a, a multifaceted approach where we use the several several components of, of several research that we've done before, and it's a very lightweight. And as you can see, the, the results speak for themselves. I think uh, not only is there an increase, but you can also use them as is. I would say. And uh, with that, yeah, I would like to thank you and I'm open for your questions. And of course, um, uh, come join our uh, SPEC RG working group uh, for predictive data analytics. Um, we meet every Wednesday and uh, yeah, we're working on standardization and real world problems, as you can see here. Looking forward to your questions. All right, thanks a lot, Mark. So I see a question from uh, David on Slack. So David, would you like to ask this question here? Because I think it's, it's a relevant one for this talk as well. Sure. The question was, you know, particularly, I mean, across papers, there were a lot of ML algorithms uh, thrown, thrown at the data to do triage. And uh, it seemed like at least a few of the papers found random forest to be the best out of that. And I was wondering if you or any of the authors had insights into what, um, why that might, if there's anything about our data that might lend it Itself, uh, to that, or if I'm just wrong also, it's just interesting trends to see. I think regarding that, Andre, do you want to grab this one? Because you're more familiar with that, I'm guessing, when, um, specifically when the forest. Yes, I can. I'm also answered in the chat. So um, why I, for example, used to apply random forest, it's in comparison to deep neural networks, very lightweight. And it has this cool feature that it's sub subsamples where 
okay it's repeating with features so one tree is only seeing for example a certain amount of a matrix and another tree is again seeing another amount of matrix and so each tree is kind of building its own version about the problem and solve it by its own and in the end the whole tree has several solutions that are in the end kind of combined and in with and in terms of classification, it's a voting system. So we reduce overfitting because of this cool um, feature of this feature subsampling. And it's very really easy to integrate and very lightweight. And the training is kind of not so intense, like for deep neural networks. And it's more easy to transfer because you don't have to build a new architecture and do all this um, feature tuning. You can almost use it as out of a box and throw your features inside. And then this future subassembling and also bootstrapping is done when uh, by its own, it's quite easy and very robust. So it that tends to overfitting like other methods. I hope it was somehow clear. Thanks, <laughs> Andrew. Uh, but to, to add to that, uh, I expect um, uh, that most ensemble methods, including uh, this one, uh would perform well uh, especially on, on performance data where uh, we have large variability uh, but other ensemble methods should also perform similarly um, that's my expectation yeah I, I agree that that's also why i i, I refer to david's question here so i think any ensemble method should work well because it it sort of targets to different aspects of the data which is good Okay, so again, this is a very interesting discussion. Uh, if you, so if you want to fight over what's the best machine learning algorithm to do this type <laughs> of stuff, I encourage you to go to Slack as well. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot, Mark. And then we'll yeah, go to the you. next, uh, the, the final talk of the session. So this is by Luke. Luke, yeah. can you please share your screen? Okay. Um, okay, can you see my yeah. screen? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, okay. So thanks a lot for, for this opportunity to have this talk. Uh, I'll be uh, presenting the last data challenge paper. This is a joint work with my supervisor, Mathieu Asher, and Bruno and Jean-Marc uh, So the goal was to do something cool with the data. And for us, what is cool is uh, to show the impact of content environment on software performance. So how the different variability layers, hardware, operating system, input data, affect software performance in general. Um, and here, this is the opportunity to apply that on what I would call the MongoDB dataset. So let's start with an example. Uh, so it's a big graph, right? But um, on top, you have the evolution of change points as defined by David Daly and colleagues. When green is positive performance change point, in red is negative performance change point. And below, you have the whole evolution of performance values uh, for six different front time environments. Uh, so, this runtime environments share a similar characteristics. So it's related to the same data set, they are related to the same project, executing the same tests on the same task, on the same hardware. The only thing changing here is the file level. And it was uh, already acknowledged by uh, Chichen, I guess, that uh, different file level lead to different performance evolution. And that's maybe why uh, random forest and ensemble method is are good. It's because uh, this type of rules are embedded in, in such a uh, ML algorithm. But what does it mean concretely? Uh, different runtime environment lead to different performance evolution. It means there's the same piece of code, uh, depending on the user, uh, uh, you will not have the same performance evolution. So let's say for, for the time series one, the first user with a fair level of 500, the performance is decreasing. I'll, for user two with a fair level of one, the performance is then increasing. So put yourself in, a, in the place of a MongoDB developer. Uh, your job is also to ensure the non regression of your system. So this is typically the type of interaction you want to avoid or at least to detect. So in the case of MongoDB, it was really fastly uh, corrected, so like in few days, it was corrected. But uh, you want to to smartly benchmark the runtime environment, the runtime environment to detect the interaction between the runtime environment of the software and the code you're developing. 
And that's uh, our contribution. So how to benchmark the different environments and explore the interaction between this and the evolution of the software. So our contribution is twofold. Uh, first, we compare the different uh, time series uh, related to different hardware platforms. And uh, by comparing this performance evolution, uh, we identify groups of hardware platforms that are homogeneous in terms of performance evolution. And this is a, a good news because by just picking one or two other platforms, uh, you have uh, all, all the group of power platform, and this allows you, uh, as a MongoDB developer, to reduce the cost of the platform. So that's the first contribution. And the second one is to define a metric uh, to identify stable uh, workloads, or the stability of workloads. Is, uh, is your workload stable in terms of performance evolution or not? Because you want to use a stable workload uh, in benchmark and unstable, maybe unstable workload deserve an additional uh, uh, care. So that's our contribution. Um, so thank you for this Zeta challenge. Uh, if I have a, a takeaway message as to mind the runtime environment and when to quantify the software evolution, um, maybe also the last message would be. Uh, for David and the MongoDB performance team, um, we have this general conclusion. Uh, but maybe to fit the gap between general and actionable conclusion, we need your feedback and your know, knowledge. Uh, maybe our conclusions are naive and want to react to them. So, so thanks for for your attention. I'll be ready to take uh, your question now. Thank you very much, Luke. Uh, so are there any questions from the audience? So while people think about questions, um, I have a question. So you're talking about uh, how we can use this to, to create benchmarks. So what do you think is still needed to create an actual benchmark from it? Are we almost there or is there still lots and lots of, of, of effort required? Mm, I, I think I think we should we should uh... We should measure uh, our properties, our characteristics. Uh, uh, I've done, I did, uh, I did some research uh, on on the, the environment, and for instance, the other platform. Maybe we need to see the pattern. Um, so, uh, when so the performance evolution is uh, the same, uh, what is the characteristic of hardware platform uh, that is uh, the cause of this uh, pattern of evolution? So this is a future work, a nice future work, I, uh, I, I think. So let's say if you have a five G gigabyte of RAM, uh, uh, it will really evolve in this way. So this is uh, something uh, to, uh, to to acknowledge. So how the different hardware or characteristic will uh, make the performance evolution evolve? That's, a, that's something something to do to add the hardware properties. Okay, thank you. Is there any other questions from the audience? I don't see anyone. So, okay, so if you have any questions uh, for Luke, please ask them on Slack. Uh, thank you, Luke, again Thanks. for the presentation. And that concludes the, the data challenge track, the, the first data challenge track session for ICP. So, again, uh, thank you all for submitting. Thank you all for attending. Um, if you're interested in contributing data for next year's data challenge track, uh, please reach out, then we can see what we can do. And thank you very much. Uh, then now we'll have a, a, a seven minute break and then we'll have the keynote from John Wilkes from Google. So very excited about that. Thank you. Thank you everybody and see you in a few minutes then. Uh, John, are you already here? I see your name in the list. Did we see him already? He is in the list. Yeah, he's also on the camera. Oh. Can you try sharing your slides? Sure, let's try that. I'm not sure whether you need additional rights from Niklas, but. Well, that looks good. Awesome. Works.
Okay, so then let's give the rest uh, their five minute break and then we start. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I, I got a weird thing saying my microphone was being disabled while I was sharing my screen, which was bizarre. <laughs> okay. Never mind. Back. Okay, good. No, all, all fine. Great.
Okay, so it is 5 p.m. in Central European time. And uh, as far as I understood, in John's time zone, it's also 5, but a.m. <laughs> um, so it's a great pleasure to nevertheless have uh, for us to have John here. He is an expert from Google working on a lot of computers, as we also read from his title. So exponentially growing uh, warehouse scale computers. That's something he does for 15 years. And he worked on yeah, many of the typical Google systems we are familiar with, so like Kubernetes, which I'm using a lot here too. And also he's interested in systems which manage themselves, I guess, with the exponential amount of systems you have there, um, it's also necessary that they manage themselves. <laughs> because otherwise you would need an army of people to manage them. And we are happy to see how you teach your machines to manage themselves. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, my apologies if you hear the occasional uh, rooster crowing in the background, um, that they have some uh, feral uh, chickens around me where I am. I'm on Maui in Hawaii at the moment, so and it's sort of early, early morning my time, late afternoon yours. Great to meet you all. Thank you very much for the invitation. So I'm going to zip through, and I understand this is the last thing of your day, uh, zip through a number of things to think about that show up when you're building the kind of scale systems that we're interested in. Um, so let's talk about scale. I found this lovely quote from John Oosterhout a little while ago. Scale has been the single most important force driving changes in system software over the last decade. I think that's a great statement. It itself is not hard, but it causes all sorts of interesting things to happen. Um, and I'm going to talk about the consequences of uh, some of those, perhaps maybe some of the ones that you hadn't thought about when uh, contemplating what it was I mean by scale. And I'm going to argue that at least some of you are probably thinking a little too small <laughs> and encourage you to sort of take a step back and sort of think about that ah, bigger. Um, I, I just uh, heard the last few minutes of something about a, um, the, the data challenge session. We published a few uh, multiple gigabytes of trace data. If you want some data to tromp around, um, let me know in the Slack and I can point you to it. Or you can look for Google cluster traces. If you, if you want things to play with that might stretch your, uh, your, your systems, there, there's some examples of some data that you can look at. So, you know, like many of you, I probably started out life by sort of looking at computer systems as things that if you were lucky fitted under a desktop, if you were very lucky fitted inside a phone, if you were super, super lucky, they were even smaller than that. Well, that's great. That's one kind of computer system. But I'm going to suggest that it's not perhaps best scoped for doing this kind of stuff. If I've got a petabyte of data, a petabyte of data, and I want to scan it for some reason, um, one of those kind of systems is probably not going to be enough. Especially if I want to do it in six minutes. So this is an actual just for Google Cloud uh, query, BigQuery, our um, um, database e engine. Um, in those six minutes, I burn nearly six days worth of computation cycles. Just a simple query, which is designed to make sure I touched every bit of data. Um, yeah, you need a lot of machines there, not just one. And each of those machines needs to be reasonably beefy, but, but you need a lot of them and you need to be co coordinated and they need to do the things you want to do and, and make sure that they're all, uh, behaving in a timely fashion. So that's why you want scale, right? So th this is obviously a fake benchmark, but you could imagine being able to look at all what your customers are doing, look at what all of your users are doing, look at what all, that statement is incredibly powerful if you can touch all of the data you have access to, and then derive insights from it. So here's a picture from above, far, far above, of uh, the kind of systems that I find myself now um, engaged with. This one happens to be uh, just outside uh, Omaha, Nebraska. It's in Iowa, just across the state border. Notice the scale here. There's a little tag about 100 meters on the bottom right. So that's the system that I'm going to be talking a bit more about today. It's a warehouse scale computer system. Um, this one sort of it's a single physical building it's subdivided into three or four parts uh, it comes with things like emergency generators it's got its own electrical substation cooling towers to make sure the thing doesn't melt down um, and it includes not just the computers but the network fabric that joins them together the inside the building um, shown here by the stuff with, with the blue cloth on it was before photo was taken before we were willing to talk about how it was done 
the uh, connections to the external world because there's no good in having an island of computation that doesn't talk to the outside. Um, the cooling system, as we mentioned, to make sure that uh, uh, things stay uh, at a reasonable temperature. The internet is in fact made of tubes, um, it's just but they do have a secondary purpose that you might expect. It also comprises people and power. Uh, this, this was a photograph of a two megawatt diesel generator. Two megawatts because that is the price optimal point. They're used for things like emergency uh, generators for buildings and it turns out that that's a sweet spot in the price performance range. But a bunch of people, right, that these buildings don't actually run themselves. You need several hundred people to look after them and make sure that the right things are happening and installing new stuff and adding more computers and upgrading them. We try to make sure that only the right people go in and out. Um, there's a whole bunch of, uh, sort of iris scanning, um, multiple levels of doors, only one person can go through at a time. We care almost as much about making sure that stuff doesn't go in as we care about people not going, uh, sorry, stuff that doesn't leave as we care about people going in. Um, so we make sure very sure that you know, only, only uh, empty disks or, uh, or or crushed ones leave the inside of the, the, the physical building. Um, so the, the scope here of the systems we're interested in talking about is the entire warehouse scale computer. Um, you, you, know, you put one of these things up and you fill it with a few tens or thousands of, of machines um, and you use it for a couple of decades at least. So the, you know, we're making decisions that will last and we're making biggish decisions. The yes or no is a few hundred million dollar decision. So it's not something you do just because ah, I need a little bit more. No, no, you, you're making a, a multi-decade investment in all of that infrastructure. The power and the cooling, for example, turns out to cost a significant fraction of the total cost of the building. Um, and you, you don't want to put one up in before you're going to need it. Um, but it turns out exponential scale is the subtitle, what it's like to supply exponential scale. It's a scary thing, right? But we, we have a few hundred examples of the data centers of different scales. Some we own, many of the big ones we own ourselves, many of the smaller ones we rent from other people. This is just a smattering of sort of where you could look for them. You can find this data publicly. Um, the green and blue lines are some um, oceanic cables. fiber cables, some of which we pulled ourselves on capacity that was available to us. So you'll see also, you know, dates in the 2020s, 21, 22, these things are coming online more and more. Um, when I first joined Google, we, we went and talked to Australia and sort of um, the telecom folk in Australia and said, we're thinking of putting a data center here because we you know a bunch of smart customers that we, we and you could benefit from. Um, we need about this much network capacity. And they sort of blanched and said, well, that's actually probably more than the network capacity for the country. So maybe not. Um, but now it looks like things are better connected. We could imagine putting one there. In fact, it looks like we have one already. Um, so again, so multiple places, uh, growing fast, connectivity is important as well. But I'm going to talk a moment to pivot about what goes inside. So what are we, what are we putting in these buildings, right? We're basically providing computation power, CPUs, RAM, and some disks and SSDs, uh, solid state, uh, because they go faster. So 99% of the, of the data will live on disks and 99% of the accesses will come from SSDs because of the performance. How hard could this be? It's fairly straightforward, right? Some number of processor chips, uh, a bit of RAM, get the right ratio and you're done. Well, not quite, right? These things continue to evolve themselves, right? The new flavors of NVRAM are cropping up at a weekly basis. Um, we'll come back to accelerators in a minute. They are complicating things, partly because they're, they're wonderful and powerful, but there's a lot of them. And if you're trying to work out how much capacity you need now, every single new kind of thing you have is another vector you have to worry about. The networking, which turns out to be the, the my day job is now in data center networking and making sure that gets supplied on time. The power we talked about, uh, the buildings, the land to put the buildings on and the water and the sewage. Entertainingly, we, we um, uh, measure water and sewage capacity in megawatts because it turns out megawatts is the unifying theme for a lot of these things. Power converts into how much uh, CPU and RAM and stuff can you support. Uh, so those are the inter internal units of capacity management at the large scale. So you have to worry about all of these things happening and the, you have to worry about the fact that they, they keep on coming up with new versions, right? So today's processor chip is not the same as the one you bought two months ago because Intel or AMD has put new firmware on it. And it behaves a little bit differently than the, than the one you bought yesterday and probably has slightly different performance properties as well. So all of these things have to be taken into account when you're making choices about what to do next. So that's sort of just, just complicated stuff. There's a lot of stuff. Um, 
the other thing that complicates stuff is the timescales we're involved in here. So this is an artist rendition of uh, the data center in Singapore. As you see, we went from a single floor data center on the right to a multi-story one on the left, four floors in this case, so the land is relatively uh, in short supply in Singapore. Um, these things don't happen in microseconds or milliseconds. Right? You, you're, you're talking multiple years of planning cycles for getting a new building up. Sometimes talking multiple weeks of time to deliver new physical uh, compute capacity, even once you've got the building and the power and the cooling and the, um, everything else working and the people to install things. So response times here are much longer than most systems that we normally experience are associated with. Talk of response times, do feel free to put questions in the, uh, the Slack channel as we go. It's fine, I will do my best to respond to them as and when I see them, or maybe Stefan can uh, call me out and say, hey, here's a question. So it's, it's uh, happy to be interactive here, it's fine. So taking a step back for level, that was you know, fun physical stuff. Um, let's talk about what we're in the business of doing here. You know, the, the, the stuff I'm gonna talk about is basically supplying the physical aspects of the computational uh, capacity required to do the stuff that Google does. So we have a fleet, we call it the collection of machines that has been deployed, and we need to be able to grow it, um, add stuff to it, in some optimal fashion, more about what that means in a second. And then we also need to upgrade it in place. Sometimes we need to tear down old stuff. Sometimes we need to, up, we can upgrade it. We can, for example, add RAM to an existing machine uh, or uh, switch a, a disk to a SSD device, if that makes sense. Um, and the networking needs to be re up, updated in situ in many, much of the time. So how hard could this be? Come on, come on, John, what are you whining about, right? There's sort of a bunch of stuff, to, to only two operations that are interesting here. Well, let's talk about optimal for a second. What do we mean by optimal? Well, this scale turns out total cost of ownership. We're, we're talking big bucks, many, many, many dollars. Um, so we care a lot about the doing this cost effectively. So, you know, let's just talk about total cost of ownership. How much does that fleet cost us? Well, that's complicated too. What do you mean by total? Um, do you mean the average? Do you mean the new stuff we're adding now or the stuff that's been in depreciating for the last three or four years? Um, are you, do you care about the fleet as a whole or one particular data center because they have different prices? It costs more to get stuff to places in the middle of uh, South America compared to the ones that are near our distribution hubs. Um, these things vary over time, right? Sort of we're, we're changing the mix of machines in one of these data centers all the time. So what is the total cost of that, the stuff inside that machine? And then cost itself, what do, you, what do you mean by that? Is that the price we paid the external vendor when we bought the stuff from them or the average of the collection of stuff in the fleet over time? Do you want to average it by month by month because we have bursts of stuff? Do you include delivery installation? Um, what happens if somebody, one part of the company buys a pile of machines, uses them for two years and then hands them down to the rest of the company? Uh, this is the way search used to do business. They, they get the new shiny stuff and then everybody else got the leftovers. How do you price those things? Do you sort of worry about the depreciation costs or do you just average over things? And then ownership, same kind of question, right? So if, a, if an individual machine is bought by one particular part of the company, does that part of the company own them? There are uh, other folk, you know, other different companies who say, yes, yes, actually, you know, this is my machine, only I can use it. But we find we actually get significant cost performance benefits from sharing equipment between different uh, use cases. So now ownership becomes much uh, fuzzier. And what happens if you've got, as we typically do, multiple applications running on that machine? How do you apportion the cost of those things? So all, the only message I'm really trying to get across here is that what sounds like a nice simple concept, we're just optimized for total cost of ownership. Ah, come on, how hard could this be? Um, you, you actually have to think through all of these questions. You can, you can we have. Um, there are plausible answers for everything. In some sense, it doesn't matter too much as long as you come up with plausible answers, everybody agrees to them. But you actually have to think through all the nuances of these things before you can get to a point where people can say, oh, yeah, that's what we're trying to do. Cool. Then we can make optimization decisions. And you end up building things like this, right? So this is a mock-up of a dashboard that somebody put together for what a planner does. So a planner for us is a person that decides how much networking capacity, RAM, storage, uh, networking, uh, sorry, about CPUs, et cetera, we, we should deploy in which place when. And this was just some mock-up sort of get across the idea of the fact that there's a few things you have to consider. You have to worry about, uh, like I said, the timeframes, where they're gonna be, because if you're, example, Gmail, or Google Meet, you are scattered across the globe and you, you don't end up 
you're not all in one place, so you have to grow appropriately. You have to look at the left-hand side, sort of growth rates and things like that. So um, what I'm really trying to get across is the fact that if you think about the cost performance of a system at the fleet scale that we're discussing here, it's an interesting technical challenge. So let's make it simpler because I've sort of been you know, in the business of scaring you a little. Let's, uh, let's wind it back down to something that seems much more plausible. So the first part is you just basically need a forecast. How much of this stuff am I going to need? Stuff is sort of computation capacity or storage capacity or network capacity. We're looking at a time scale over a you know, couple of years, probably, let's say 18 months. You turn that into the long end of that time scale, gives you the prediction you need to decide, hey, new, new, new building, let's get started on one. Uh, a couple of years later, you might have a, a new building if you're lucky. Uh, longer if you're worrying about negotiating land, contracts for land and things like that. Then you put stuff in it, you fill it up. We don't actually fill the whole building at once because that's super expensive. What you want to do is to fill it up just in time because the recent material um, equipment is usually faster, cheaper, shinier than the stuff that you bought a couple of years ago. So the, the longer you can defer, the probably the less money you're going to be spend, spending. For example, optics are things that plug into the fibers. They depreciate at a, a few tens of percent um, over their lifetime, or sort of acquisition lifetime of a few years. So it's well worth deferring as much as you can. On the other hand, you never want to be late because if you're late, what that means is the business that was trying to do whatever it was trying to do, delivering um, meat or uh, email or ads or whatever it is that you think is important, um, lost opportunity for doing something that they could have got value from. So being late is always very expensive. Being early is merely expensive. Once you've got the physical stuff, we want to slice and dice it and make it available. So there's a whole talk that you can find about Borg, which is our compute allocation system. Um, that's what Borg and Kubernetes have a common framework. A lot of people worked on both. Um, so those systems sort of slices and dice the computational capacity and hand it out in sort of retail fashion to people, bless them, who use it. Uh, ideally, a lot of them use it a lot. Um, and then that gives you information which you feed into the forecast. So great, cool, nice, nice cycle here. So you, you, you use data about usage to make your forecasts. And then you apply some back pressure because if you don't apply back pressure, people will say, I can grow at 40% a year. No, 40% a month, no, et cetera, right? So you have to have some way in that, yes, yes, but uh, let's not do it more than it actually makes business sense. So we internally, we charge our different product areas. Um, imagine you know, Google Maps is a product area, cloud is a product area, search is a product area. We, we basically charge them the cost of providing the compute capacity that they consume to deliver their services. So there is some back pressure and they have to occasionally have to compete if we have scarce resources, as we sometimes do. They can't all get what they want. So somebody comes in and says, yeah, you can only have 40% of what you asked for. Sorry. OK, great. So let's drill down into this general flow a little bit. Let's talk about forecasting for a second. So this is uh, live data from um, a paper about Jupiter, which is our network fabric. I picked it up. You'll see why in a moment why I chose this one. Um, actual data measured from the, the networking systems over a, a few years. And if you're a planner sitting at this point going, well, how much more networking should I buy if I have a, you know, say a few weeks or months of lead time here? I might do that. Perfect sense, right? Just fit a straightforward, smooth curve. Cool, great. But it turns out you, you know, you maybe you were a little over enthusiastic a couple of months ago and you overordered. So you're going to sit on your set, sit on this for a while and see, yeah, is this projection, this forecast is a good one. New data comes in. Uh-oh. That's going to be expensive. Remember, we're talking real money here, right? We're actually spending large amounts of dollars in order to be able to put that. that. That kind of kink is frightening. You're doubling or quadrupling the rate at which you have to buy equipment. Oh dear. Oh well, let's get ordering. Uh, maybe we should wait a little longer, just in case. New data comes in. Oh, I'm glad we didn't do that. Um, but they've got another problem. This is flattening out. That's A, worrying, B, slightly disconcerting and probably not right. And in fact, not right is the correct response at this point. Um, and there was just a data gathering glitch for uh, a year or so. We, we managed to drop a bunch of data on the floor by mistake. Um, but this is the forecasting business. You're making bets where you don't know what the future is going to be. You have to predict what will be happening in the face of things like measurement uncertainty, real data noise. Um, and so on. So and these bets are expensive, right? If we're talking about an entire data center, a few hundred million dollars, if you're talking about how much networking or 
we're talking about a few tens of millions of dollars. We're talking about the computers. It's probably in the, um, the few hundred million dollars per month, more than that, a little while. So what do we actually do? So we divide the what we know into three buckets, basically. The stuff we actually know, so the individual product areas have decided, I'm actually going to buy a pile of machines. I've ordered them. Great, the order has been sent. That sort of gives you a few weeks worth of runway, which is great for acquiring machines. It's not great for acquiring buildings. We ask the product areas, good, what's your business going to be doing? You know, Cloud, what, what do you think your growth rate is um, for the next, I don't know, 18 months-ish or so? And they will go, oh, yeah, that's hard. How about for six months, right? <laughs> and make up a number. And then you look at it and you go, no, come on, come on, come on, come on, really? Um, and then we sort of a lot of back and forth here, right? So it's a mixture of sort of organic growth. You can you know, look at those nice smooth curves, but then there will be occasional things that somebody will say, but we're launching this brand new product, which will double our sales. Trust me, trust me. Um, I need more capacity than you think. And you, 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 whack, you haggle. And then finally, we have what I call lovingly more forecasting magic, which is we have a central team that is basically staring at the aggregation across all of these things and making the long term forecast. So they're the people that worry about the five year forecast for things like power um, and submarine cables because they take a while to deliver once you decide you want one. And then the other thing that complicates stuff is things like this. Um, it's an old graph, but a good one. Um, so the orange, this is a, an example of a cloud customer who um, was sort of new, new to the, the, their, uh, their product and they made a prediction of what their product would do. That was the orange uh, capacity. And they, you know, turned out a bunch of people in this company had used to work at Google. So they were pessimistic and said, well, let's, let's sort of multiply it by five just to make sure there's a split spare capacity just in case, you know, things go a little bit better than we thought. And the green line shows what actually happened when they launched Pokemon Go. The horizontal time scale here is weeks, not years, weeks. Uh, this was an exciting ride. Um, the, and the illusion of the cloud, which is you know, what we try and sell to everybody, like all of our competitors, is you can have as much capacity as you want. Well, yes, but if you do this and you're large scale, then maybe the answer is you should talk to us because <laughs> we might need to help. Um, and in fact, what happened was a bunch of Niantic engineers and a bunch of Google engineers went and sort of looked at things like sort of how do we reduce the amount of CPU cycles your product consumes in order to allow us to make sure we meet the capacity you need. So we helped them make their product more efficient to make sure we didn't run out of compute cycles and data stock transactions in order to help them launch. And they launched and it's a wild success. right? And, and that, that, that this is the, the kind of fun story, but it complicates this game. Right. If you're in the forecasting business, how do you predict one of those things coming? If you've got one of those things, it's and they're a small company, it's fine. Right. Sort of you're a one or two person startup is great. But if you're one of the big customers and you do this, uh, that becomes much more interesting. So we do, you know, we have special deals with people for things like Black, Black Friday, Cider Monday, uh, where we plan for those things multiple months in advance and lock down capacity to make sure you don't have accidents. But we don't have accidents. What you end up building is systems that look like this, right? Sort of just fun graph. I'm not going to go into the details, thankfully, for everybody here, including me. Um, each of these boxes represents itself a mildly complicated computer system doing some clever stuff. Typically, uh, it's a running service that will have sort of multiple copies. It's doing analytics based on information we've seen in the past, plus trends we've seen, plus uh, information that's coming in about what's coming, and so on. And you know, what comes out of this is. Here's a prediction of how much of whatever it is we think we're going to need as a function of time. Here's where we think we're going to put it. Here's the advice to people who are making the choices about how much stuff to go purchase and buy. And then eventually over the long term, sort of here's the planning uh, uh, recommendations. And again, people make decisions. Let's, I recommend we build a new building here on this date. Okay, sure. Let me sign the check. Um, great. So that's the end of the first section. I'm happy to take questions if there are any, but I don't see any yet. So feel free to, to poke in. We're going to switch gears for a second. I've hinted at this as uh, power as sort of as a common denominator for a bunch of things. Um, power is interesting, right? We're pr proud to say we actually generate more, we have cause to come into the world, more electricity generation from things like uh, wind power, this one's in Northern Holland and, um, and the like than we consume across the company, which is great. But unfortunately, the electrons generated in um, Northern Holland aren't great for that data center in Singapore. So we've now got a second problem, which is how do we try and find a way to reduce the, the local amount of non-green energy that we consume? 
So the first thing to do is to plot it. So this is a graph of a data center. So the x-axis here is time in terms of days. This is an entire year's worth of uh, data of the power consumption in a data center. Green stuff is good power, you know, generated in this case by wind. Black stuff is bad power, generated in this case by burning coal. Well, this is a data center in Iowa. It's actually the one we were looking at earlier. And as you can see, in the middle of the summer, during the middle of the day, there's a lot more blackness than there is in the rest of the year. And it turns out apparently wind doesn't blow hot enough or enough in Iowa in, uh, in the summer. Can I, question, can I estimate the risk of various decisions? Um, uh, great question, yes. Yeah, so think of it this way. If you make a positive decision that it was wrong, the money you just invested may go to waste. So you build an extra data center that you don't need. Ouch, that's a few hundred million dollars. That's not quite as bad as that. What it probably means is you built it a year or two earlier before you needed it. So you're really just looking at a few hundred million dollars times a year or so of depreciation. If you underestimate how much you need, we're looking, we typically internally use a factor of about five. So under, under provisioning is five times as expensive as over provisioning just because of the business consequences of, uh, of, of that. Um, yep, so this is in terms of capacity, right? Sort of we're looking at total performance. So that's why everybody, when they're making their estimations about how much compute capacity they're gonna need, if you go talk to the people who are running processing um, work, they all overestimate because you know, it's really bad to not have enough. So they take a number that they think they double it. Um, so a lot of the work that the sort of infrastructure team that I'm part of does, is we're second guessing the overestimations that people are making. <laughs> so we often find it unhelpful to go back to people and say, how much RAM do you think you need? And we, we instead say, let's go measure how much you're using and use that as a better projection. Uh, here's something else you can do. So the gray stuff here shows um, essentially carbon intensity, uh, essentially maps onto the previous picture. Like in the middle of the day, you have to burn coal, so that's really high carbon intensity. In the middle of the night, you get wind power, awesome. The baseline load is what would have happened if we hadn't done anything special. And it sort of bounces around up and forth, back and forth during the day. But what you'd like to do to reduce your carbon consumption is to take, say, hmm, maybe there's some stuff during the middle of the day where we would have to burn um, coal in order to get enough electricity that we could defer and push to the middle of the night either bring it forward or defer it. So you, you're in the market now for trying to find comp computations that can be brought forward or backwards. And we've actually started doing this. So we're, we're running this now inside our data centers to sort of migrate work away from those peak times. The other benefit you get is often you can actually reduce the, the absolute size of the highest peak, which means you can now spend a lot less money provisioning uh, power and, and capacity. All good. So we're starting down this path. We're, we're by no means finished, but uh, work, is, work is progressing. Sometimes people ask me, but what about all that waste heat you're generating? You know, gigawatts of power going to oh, tens of megawatts of power. By the way, sort of typical capacities we're talking about is sort of 40 megawatts to 240 megawatts for a building. So there's a lot of energy going into these things, all of which eventually turns into heat. Can't you reuse it? The answer is mostly no, because it comes out by the time we're done with it at not very high temperature and high temperature. Um, heat is useful, low temperature heat, not so much. There's a bunch of people who propose various things. If you happen to be next to be a desalination plant, you might be able to use that with it. If you're heating homes, uh, KTH in Stockholm does this. Um, but, but mostly the time, what we try to do is to make sure we don't have too much of this. We, we, we are as energy efficient as possible about keeping those data centers cool. So this graph is basically a plot over time of how good we are at the cooling side of the business, right? So PUE is essentially the ratio of the total power that you use doing useful stuff. Um, sorry, total power going into the building divided by the power you use for doing useful stuff, computation. Ideally one, um, bounded from above, is probably never going to hit one because of things like transformer overheads and power conversions. But we're running at about 10% overhead for doing all of the cooling required to keep those buildings from not melting down. That's pretty good. It's been getting slowly better. We're pretty good now. There's a few cases where, you know, it's seasonal, so it goes up and down a bit. The best I've seen in practice is sort of quarterly average about 7% of overheads. So if you're looking for ways to save energy, by far the best way to save it is to write better software. Make your algorithms more efficient. Do less foolish recalculations of stuff you did yesterday. Um, 
and then all the stuff that I'm talking about here is just sort of icing on the cake in many ways. Let's see, what implications do I think the tradition of clouds towards serverless computing have? Um, there's no such thing as serverless computing. It's a terrible name, right? This just means we're hiding from you the server we chose to put the computation on. Of course, there's servers behind serverless computing. Um, and because of that hiding, the abstraction costs computational cycles and therefore energy and power. So it's probably less efficient than doing stuff uh, by having direct access to servers if you can fill the servers effectively. So uh, serverless computing is awesome from the point of view of a consumer. Please keep using it. It's great. It lets you, you do and have a really nice level of abstraction. From the point of view of a service provider, we still have to do all the things you would normally do in the Borg or Kubernetes world, but now we're just providing the computational cycles to run those serverless quote unquote computations for you. Cool, good question. And let's see, are you actively considering other climate impact? Um, heating of lakes with cooling water? Yeah, uh, we, we worry about those things. Um, there are, uh, as you might imagine, sort of interactions with local authorities to make sure we're not you know, boiling lakes. Uh, we have various things in Finland, for example, where we actually use ocean water cooling. So yes, we're very conscious. Uh, we try our best to be consumers of, of uh, resources in a, a, a environmentally friendly way. That's something we care about a lot as a company. We're spending a lot of money to not use more electricity than we should, as we'll see in a minute. We're also spending a lot of money to try and make sure that we, we actually will buy long-term power wind farm purchases. Uh, contracts in order to come into the cause to come into the world a lot more power that would otherwise and green power that would otherwise happen so yes we we, we care and we are willing to spend, put our money behind it so thanks one of the things that helps with this is the trend the switch towards these um, accelerators right so you're probably all familiar with moore's law and how it sadly is not behaving the way it used to behave once upon a time you just wait and you've got more computational power on and your regular single chip single core processing. Not so much anymore. Um, but what is happening is the number of cores is still growing, right? So the, the silicon vendors are still managing to pack more transistors on chips. They're just not going any faster than they used to, um, and they are not giving you single core performance. But if you want lots of cores, you can get lots of cores these days that you couldn't get before. So we, like many other people, are basically switching to a mode where uh, we're using um, sort of GPU-like things. Our version of it is called a tensor processing unit to allow the TensorFlow. Um, we did one version in 2015. That was sort of a warm-up activity, first, first major chip design for us uh, in this space. That, and then in 2017, we came up with a version that we, you could now, you could rent for, through the cloud on a 0.2 petaflops. Okay, yeah, interesting. We probably now have more computational capacity and accelerators inside Google than we do have in processor cores. And look at the dates here to give you some idea of the rate of growth of, of what's going on here. Um, but one of these things is nice, but as we saw before, you know, you need to have collections of them to get interesting amounts of computation done. So we pack them together into these things we call pods. So this one here is a bunch of them. Um, up to 11 and a half petaflops by this stage, 2017. Um, just fun fact, the different colors here represent cable lengths. So if you're a person physically wiring these things, you have some guidance as to, you know, a pink one is a short cable. Okay, great. Blue one is a long cable, etc. cetera. Um, I've seen uh, network um, racks where there's basically a sort of rainbow color uh, effect because of the way the cable connectivity goes, that people have carefully chosen the right cable lengths. Uh, okay, 2017, but life moves on. That turns out to be one of the limitations was air cooling. So that's an air cooled system. And we decided that wasn't enough to keep these things going. Uh, so we now water cool our TPU chips, the next generation, and then we collect more of them together. So now we're in the 100 petaflop range. We got up to 2018 now. This is giving us an enormous amount of computation power. You know, if you're doing things like ML, you can take advantage of the fact that these things have low precision arithmetic, but they go fast and they do an awful lot of it in parallel. And your error correction curve, uh, terms in your machine learning reinforcement systems can cope with the fact that you have relatively low accuracy calculations, and that's fine. So it gets you the kind of scale of automatic speech recognition and things like that that we couldn't do before. 
Uh, so one of those pods is nice, but what happens if you want to collect many of them? So that's what we're now doing, right? So we now have fancy networking, which allows us to glue these things together. So we now have multiple pods collaborating on single uh, training exercises. Um, we're in the exaflop range now. This is an insane amount of computation. Um, uh, one of the things that still strikes me as weird at Google is that I can sit in a meeting where people will show, demonstrate a graph. You know, here's a graph of the fleet capacity, and, and the, the, the y axis is in X or something or others, and nobody falls off their chair because um, people just got used to this. <laughs> it's still bizarre. Um, but it causes you to think about all of those tail behaviors that you don't get. You know, a one in a million chance of something happening means it's happening probably a few times a second. Uh, the things we need to care about. So that's where the, the software complexity comes in. It's sort of, it's sort of a mixture of, of kinds of things and the fact that we're always in the tail behavior for these bits and pieces. So that includes, in this case, the, the, the conversation we've been having so far, right? So we start with a bunch of stuff from the top left-hand corner. Here's the system that's running. Here's a very simplified version of what we've just been talking through. This loop happens to go the other way around, but it's the same loop. We're in the prediction business of guessing how much capacity we're going to need in sufficiently far advance time that we can go plan for supplying it. We can make requests to the supply chain to go deliver it. We can install it, test it, turn it on, so turn it on and test it, um, and then deliver it and, and package it and make it available to the operations people. And then, of course, you know, if you're not looking at things and uh, monitoring it, you've got to assume that stuff is out of control because uh, that's what happens. But that, that's one time scale. So it turns out that the people who do machine planning and the deciding of how many machines and how much RAM and how much how many accelerators to buy and things like that, they would love to be able to operate at the sort of zero to six month time horizon because there's less uncertainty. The further out you go, the, the wider the cones of uncertainty get and the more money you have to hedge against those, uh, those high end size of things. The way we do it internally is that we've you know, got a dozen or so product areas, each of which has their own planning activity. They all make their own forecasts and they make their own decisions about how much capacity they're going to ask for, subject to a pile of policies, which we're not going to go into. There is thankfully only one Google supply chain. So we, they all sort of come together at one point where we go, yeah, you can get what you need or no, sorry, you can't have that. Would you like to reconsider? Maybe you can't have it there, but you could have it here. That's a possibility. Maybe you can juggle your workload, sort of move it from one place to another. Um, they also operate at the 12 to 18 month time horizon. So this is the time horizon you need for things like deciding how much RAM you're going to need for the company. So you can pick up the phone and call a RAM supplier to make sure they've got enough factories constructed to be able to deliver the RAM you're going to need to 18 months from now. Um, when you get that wrong, it's painful, especially if you get it wrong in the, I didn't get asked for enough, uh, stage because now you can't build enough machines to meet the need that your products have and you end up with supply shortages and that's very painful so, so those the supply choices down at these time horizons constrain what you can construct right we know 12 to 18 months ahead of time the upper band on the number of machines we can build and then we'll make decisions on the next zero to six month time as to how many we'll actually go uh, construct or manufacture and then there's a similar kind of constraint which operates at the building level, right? If you don't have enough buildings, then it doesn't matter whether you can buy enough RAM or CPU chips or what have you, because no, you haven't, won't have any way to put them. So all of these things act as a constraint on the thing um, in the shorter time frame. Um, and remember, we said that the, the cone of uncertainty gets bigger and bigger the further out you go. So this is an uncomfortable position to be in if you're a building planner. But that's hey, that's what we do. That's this is where we spend our time. So a lot of what I'm you know, my day job is basically helping people through this cycle for the networking space. I don't usually worry about the power and data center space, but I am definitely in the 12 to 18 month uh, shorter time horizon. Uh, basically building software systems to help people think through what the performance implications are of what they've got. We try to anticipate what the next generation networking is going to be doing, how much we're going to, what the granularity of supply is for it, and build, give people uh, tooling to help sort of make recommendations as to how much stuff they should plan. Also, that when you get going, some you can in the chat, run you to take 10,000 copies of Hello World, which I did once. It took two and a half minutes just for fun. <laughs> All right, almost done. Um, and then, like I said, we talked about scale. A couple of questions. I'll come back to those if you don't mind. Um, so when I first started poking around at this, we were spending about $30 billion over three years. That was 2017. That's so um, a couple of years ago time frame. In 2021, we spent almost the same amount in a single year. 
And over the last three years, we've spent about $70 billion on capital equipment, the majority of which is going into our data centers. There's a couple of buildings in New York, but you know, eh, they're small. Um, $70 billion over three years. This is big business. It's important to get, you know, a 1% delta in accuracy here, more than pay, well more than pays for my salary and probably most of my colleagues. Uh, it's important to get this stuff right. But that also gives you wonderful opportunities, right? So we have challenges, but we also have opportunities, right? We can make a difference here. We can make a big difference. So the message I hope I managed to get across here is, you know, this wonderful illusion that we offer of the cloud has a lot of technology behind the scenes that calls it to, uh, make it cost effective, which is what we would like to make it uh, accessible to you so you can get the computation you need when you need it. And at this scale, multiplying um, decisions you make by very large numbers uh, causes very big impacts, and that's kind of fun. And then obligatory plug, we're always hiring. We are growing exponentially. One of the things we want to do is to try and find a way to grow the number of people we have at a lower rate than the number of machines we have, which is uh, why automation and software is, is so important and, and predicting performance and their behavior and their uh, attributes matter so much. Thank you, great, that's it. That's my talk. Happy to take more questions. We've got a couple of minutes left before we go, but there were, I think, a couple of questions. Yeah, maybe first of all, thank I, you for I the one. How did the resource management scheduling problems change with the scale of computing facilities? How did the solutions? What's the most impactful technique you see? Okay, great. Um, so the problems. I'll give you an example of a problem. We used to plan data center networking capacity on spreadsheets. That was in an era where we were deploying eh, a few dozens of new network projects um, a quarter. We're now in the multi hundred projects per quarter, and that doesn't work anymore, right? People don't scale. So we had to, we switched to an automation system. Version one of that automation system turned out to be essentially mimicking what the people did. It turned out to be people are very flexible and computers are not, at least software isn't, uh, when if you rip, write it the wrong way. So we're now doing version two of that system, which is sort of putting into uh, a great deal more flexibility than we had, because what we built was a very rigid system that let us scale, but turned out to be very brittle. And if you make a mistake or some of the input data is wrong, then uh, those kind of things happen. So what I've seen is that as the scale gets bigger and we, we expect more and more computational assistance, in terms of your solutions, then you need to pivot your emphasis towards things like, is the data correct? Is all of your descriptions about the way the buildings are constructed accurate? Is the pillar actually there or is it six inches to the left? Because that makes a difference as to whether you can put a rack in that, that spot or not. Right? And you don't want to discover that at the last minute under time pressure when you're uh, trying to make sure that people get stuff delivered. The other things that have changed, at least in my world, is that the, the Emphasis on speed has altered, right? I, I talked a lot about sort of don't ever under deliver. Um, we've sort of basically got that under control. Um, but now the question is sort of how can we do it faster? How can we reduce the time it takes to from I want one to here it is working um, by, well, let's say a, a factor of two to 10. So that, that changes the way you build all the way you think through things. It changes the way you do planning, it changes the way you do interaction with the other systems. It turns out you can't get into a building to do networking until all that dust has been got out of the way. So you're interacting with the people doing construction in interesting ways, but maybe you can get early access for installing some of the racks as long as you don't try to put fiber optics in there and so on. So this just sort of calls you to change how you think about things. So the, a lot of the way you can reduce um, inefficiencies and, and improve uh, cost effectiveness is by taking less time to do stuff. So there's a lot of automation. I'm, we're engaged in those kind of things. Other than that, uh, as we said earlier, right, the tail behavior um, is a continuous thing. I, I've talked to an academic colleagues who say, you know, but uh, I can't possibly imitate what happens at big scale. You know, I can't do anything like you do. Nonsense. Of course you can. Right? Think of all the things that could go wrong in the environment and inject them at way higher than a realistic rate. But things like failures, uh, failures happen all the time. If they, like I say, imagine a one in a million failure rate or a 1% annual failure rate for a piece of hardware. Great, what happens if you pretend that it's 40%? Just start injecting those kind of uh, imitated failures into your test setup so you get a feel for what it's like to operate in, in, the, in the corner of the, of, the end of the exercise. All right, good. Somebody else? Also moved from spreadsheets. Excellent, yes, good for them. Um, 
Oh, those are the answers. Okay, good. Oh, that was me. Cool. Great. More questions. There's a question about the chip shortage. Does it impact you in your? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry, I must have lost them. Yes. Uh, so. Um, some of the chip shortage appears to be, I'm, I'm, I'm a news reader like the rest of you, seems to be the, the uh, auto manufacturers in particular underestimated the number of chips they would need. That 12 to 18 month time horizon, they, um, gave, they guessed low. And the people who produce chips have that kind of time frame, and they didn't build enough fab capacity to support them. So um, that's just an unfortunate consequence. We worry about things like that. So far, we muddle through or accurately, beautifully predicted. It varies a bit. Um, sometimes we overpredict, sometimes we underpredict, and then cover it up with other things. Um, but so far, we are mostly doing okay. We did see some significant hiccups during COVID when that first kicked in. A bunch of the supply chains had a lot of trouble. For example, I mean, our fiber manufacturers they they struggled to you know we, we consume hundreds of kilometers of fiber for some of these things um, they struggled a bit but we found ways to cope um, we occasionally get sort of hiccups you know the certain chipset that is no longer available for a particular part there's one of those conversations taking place right now and what happens is you know you work out where the most efficient most useful way to deploy your limited capacity is and you ask other people who get the nose sort of and what, what else could you do? Maybe there's a previous generation you could live with, or maybe you could uh, find capacity over here, or maybe you could defer that product launch or, or what have you, or maybe you could invest some of your engineering effort into making your software more efficient rather than producing new features. Eh? Business choice, right? So there's, there's many, many opportunities um, and uh, people, people apply all of them in different contexts. Okay. Maybe a final one, there was the question, what is the delta between a data center which is underutilized and a data center which is fully utilized? Yeah, um, so have a look at the um, bulk papers that I and a few colleagues wrote over the last few years. You'll, you'll see actual utilization numbers in there for computational capacity. Uh, the numbers for networking and storage are a bit different, but the, the general goal is, you know, you, we want to get them as high as we can. The numbers you see in the board paper are, um, they, I, I, I'm not quoting them here because we're being recorded and I can't remember them off the top of my head, uh, <laughs> but go look them up. Uh, but I can tell you that they are not as high as we would like and we're trying to work on how do we increase the utilization. The trouble with increasing utilization is that you maybe put at risk the chance of coping with a failure, right? If a data center goes offline for some reason, all that work needs to go somewhere. Right? We, we don't want to stop serving external load. We want to move it to somewhere else. So you have to have some headroom for that. Um, you also have some to have some headroom for the uncertainty. You know, we talked about, you know, maybe there is a chip shortage. And if you're a product area and you've got a really important launch that you want to go through, maybe you sh you're going to hedge your bets. So one of the things that we spend a lot of time doing is trying to find all the multiple places that people are hedging bets. Right? Supply chain is hedging itself. The planners are hedging. The people who are asking the planners for capacity are hedging, the um, applications themselves are hedging and so on, the business folk are hedging um, and, and double counting there turns out to be super expensive and reduce its utilization. Um, in fact, I've just, I, I've uh, actively started work in the last couple of months on doing sort of some fine grained, um, if what we call efficiency calculations or sort the of metrics for sort of the networking side, you know, where is the money going that we could be not spending by overbuilding? So ultimately, if we discover places where we are building more capacity than we need, then we should build less capacity. Um, and that's the way you increase efficiency. But you want to do it in a way because there's all lots of short-term spikiness in a fashion that doesn't hurt. For example, MySpace networking. Right? There's no point in delivering networking capacity which keeps the average amount of uh, network traffic working because we have enormous diurnal variations and, and huge bursts. Um, so if you look at sort of 99th percentile and the 32nd averages, they're significantly different than the long-term averages for the total capacity that gets consumed. So you actually have to worry about what is the behavior on applications? How, 
how much are we willing to squeeze in order to uh, sort of how much can we squeeze excuse me um, before you start impacting the application behavior and user perceived latency you don't want your searches to run slower because that causes people to get grumpy um, and maybe they go somewhere else if things take too long and the same kind of thing so you, you start interacting with the sort of tail at scale behavior you see in a paper by Jeff Dean and company um, so we want to be hovering just outside the edge of that. And to do that, you actually need some slack capacity to cope with the burstiness. Um, but just how much is, is an interesting uh, conversation. As I said, the, the, you can see some of this data for the board computations in the uh, the last board paper, which accomplishes, uh, accompanied the tr new traces we put out. Um, so yeah, feel free to look. Um, and just for calibration, um, these numbers for the, the, that we and you know our, our competitors get for data centers are way higher than traditional data centers. You are lucky in a traditional data center if you've got 10 to 15 percent utilization out of your assets. Things are much better in, in the cloud. Hey, so when looking at the time, I think we have to come to an end here. I thank you uh, from my side for these interesting insights into the Google data centers. Really amazing technology. Um, and I think everybody else can will join me. And uh, yeah, having that said, um, I hand over to um, Philip for the award ceremony. Maybe we do a five minute break or something like that. Yeah, we can do a short leg stretch while we get started and then we can start with the award session. Thank you, John, also from my side. It was an awesome presentation. Thank you for getting up so early for us. <laughs> Great. I'm going to go off and do some snorkeling now, so yes. <laughs> then Actually, I'll, regard I'll, 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 I'll hang around the Slack chat for a few minutes if everybody has more questions. Thank you. Right. So Take care. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Send our regard, in regards to the rooster. We have heard a lot <laughs> from the rooster. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Right. Okay, then let's let's do it like this. Let's take four minutes of break and let's start at five uh, five to six. And we're probably going to run a little bit over time, but everybody can grab a beverage and then we can get the award ceremony underway and close today for today. Hey, Philip, will you be presenting the next slides or should I be? Well, David, uh, yeah, I will be saying, uh, I will be, do you have slides for the, for the presentation? Great, thanks. Now, do you have slides? Do you have slides? Yes, you to yeah, I do have slides, uh, so I can display or you can, uh, it's up to you. Okay. I, okay, then let's do it like this. I will do a short introduction and then you can share your screen and uh, present the award. And okay. then I will continue from there. Sounds good. Okay, excellent.
So I would say let's get started. Let's continue with what is the last session for the day. Uh, so now what we have planned is to do a short award ceremony where we are going to announce first the Distinguished Dissertation Award by SPEC. And we are very happy that we have David Reiner, uh, the SPEC president, join us for this part of the, um, of the, of the meeting. And then afterwards, we're also going to present some awards uh, specifically for the ICP conference. Uh, but before that, David, I give the word to you and you can announce the 2021 dissertation award winner. Okay, thanks a lot, Philip. You can see my screen. Yes. Great. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm David Reiner, the president of SPEC. Very happy to be with you today. Um, so this is the Cavalia Dixit Distinguished Dissertation Award. Uh, so Cavalia Dixit was the first president of SPEC um, that passed away in 2004, um, and we present this today in his honor. Um, this award is an annual award that aims to recognize outstanding doctoral dissertations in terms of scientific originality, scientific significance, practical relevance, impact, and presentation. So I'm pleased to present uh, this year's um, award to the uh, dissertation automated hybrid time series forecasting design benchmarking and use cases by Dr. Andre Bauer of the University of Würzburg. Congratulations, Andre. Thank you. Um, and this year we also have a runner up. Um, so the runner up um, award, oh, sorry, that the supervisor is um, Professor Sam Kunyev, who's with us today. So congratulations, Sam. Um, the runner up uh, for this award this year, because we had two uh, very high qual quality dissertations we thought made sense to award both. Um, the runner up is enabling high performance, large scale irregular computations. Um, and this was um, by Dr. Masia Besta um, of ETH Zurich. So congratulations, Masia. Um, and has supervised, supervised by Dr. Hofler. So thanks a lot, it was great to be with you guys. Keep up the good work on the dissertations and Spec is pleased to be one of the primary sponsors of this uh, conference. So thanks a lot, back to you, Philip. Thank you. Uh, congratulations to the winner also uh, to the winners also from my side. Um, let me briefly share my screen. Sorry about that. So in addition to the uh, dissertation award, we also have a couple of other awards that are given out kind of routinely by, by the SPEC, uh, ACM SPEC uh, ICP conference. And we want to announce these uh, now in the last session for the day. And so basically there's four different types of prizes that we normally hand out in the, in the umbrella of ICP uh, conferences. And you have already heard about the dissertation award, so I'm not gonna talk about uh, 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 this one, and also this is not an ICPE award, it's just given out in the context of ICP. But in addition to that, we also have um, the 10 year most influential paper award. Uh, so this year, the 10 year most influential paper award is given out to the, to, the, to the most influential paper from the 2012 edition of ICP. Then we give out uh, paper awards for both the industry and the research track. And we also want to uh, award the best reviewers for the conference. So we also give out review awards for the, uh, for both for the research and for the industry track. So me and Nico are now gonna go over the, the, the winners of these three types of awards uh, you know, for, for, for this year. Uh, before that, very, very, very important also to mention uh, or to give our thanks to the two awards chairs that we had this year, uh, Klaus and Divaka. Uh, especially Klaus, who has kind of made very nice physical awards, which we're going to show. So, kind of a kind of a last-minute voluntary work from his side to to actually make very nice awards. So we we joked before that the only physical part of the of our virtual conference are the awards that we're going to send out. <laughs> and yeah, we have Klaus to to, to thank for that. Um, so thanks a lot to our awards chairs for kind of doing this very important activity. So, uh, Nico, do you want to announce the review awards? 
yeah, you just need to click for me. Yeah. So now coming to the best review awards, we have best review awards for the industry and experience track and for the research track. And now, Philip, the next slide. Yeah, we decided uh, for two best re review awards this year in the research track. And it was hard to, to distinguish who is senior and who is junior res um, reviewers. So we said uh, we give one award to a person who is in the PC for the first time and one who, who was there for several years. Already. And speaking in general, so seeing all the reviews, um, they were very constructive, but few really stood out of the mass. And it's it's a pleasure to announce that Lubomir from Charles University Prague um, is our um, best paper reviewer, uh, best review award of OD, uh, together with Christoph Laber from Similar Research Laboratory in Oslo. And as far as I can see, we have Christoph here. So congratulations, Christoph. Great job. Thanks. Thank you for your service. Cheers. Um, so for the best review awards in the industry track, we have uh, Raphael Eidenbenz from ABB Power Grids Research, Hitachi ABB. And uh, in uh, this track, we, we really had a sub-reviewer who stood out uh, with awesome reviews um, from Judith Packard Enterprise. So Ankit Chukse, I'm not sure if you are here. I try to invite the recipients of the awards, but I'm not sure if I was, was it too short notice or wrong time zone. So we will communicate the awards and yeah, it's really helpful to have good reviewers uh, to uh, provide feedback to all the submissions. With this, congratulations again for the industry track review awards. Um, I would like to continue with um, the 10 year most impact paper award. And behind this, it's a huge process uh, with 12 senior people of the community involved, nominating papers from 10 years ago, uh, looking at them, discussing, not only looking at the citations, but also other criteria. Uh, and then there is a voting process. So it's quite complicated, but it should be also unbiased, of course. And yeah, the winner of this year's 10, 10 year most impact award is the paper from uh, how a consumer can measure elasticity for cloud platforms from Sadika Islam. Kevin Lee and Alan, Alan Fekete, Anna Liu from, um, also from Australia, University of Sydney. And here you see a photo from the really engraved physical awards that we, that Klaus prepared uh, and, and we will ship them. It's, yeah, you see them also in the camera. It's really <laughs> not a PDF only. We, uh, it's great that we have something physical in this virtual conference and, for this award. Um, congratulations to them. Um, as you see, they are from Australia, so it's in the middle of the night. Um, so we arranged uh, also that they give us like a reflection how, how they per perceive the, their own impact of the paper in the past 10 years. And they uh, really recorded a nice video of nine minutes we will show tomorrow um, at the start of the third conference day. So we will, uh, they will also then join for short Q&A. This brings us now to the best paper awards. Yeah, and thank you. To... So congratulations to all the winners. So now let's discuss the best paper awards. So as you have hopefully already seen over the course of the last two days, we had a lot of excellent contributions as we always have uh, for ICP. And as always, we are trying to find what are the best papers among the, the, the kind of batch that we reviewed. And the decision is really made kind of in conjunction between the, the reviewers, the PC chairs, so me and Nico this year, and the awards chairs. And so we don't only go by the, by the reviews, but we also discuss the papers quite intensely. And uh, since ICPE is historically a very kind of 
a conference that tries to be very close to industry. We are also trying to give out uh, uh, paper awards specifically for the industry and experience tracks. And for both the research track and the industry and experience track, we have decided to actually give out two kind of awards similar to the dissertation award. So for both tracks, we have given out a runner up award and an actual uh, winner at the end. So let's start with the, with the industry track for now. So the best paper runner up in the industry track this year is why is it not solved yet? Challenges for production ready auto scaling by Martin Stresser and his team from University of Würzburg. So some well-known names in the community here in our industry track uh, run up. Congratulations from our side. Thank you very much. <laughs> We're really happy about it. <laughs> Thank you. So this was the run up for the industry track. And then the winner in the industry track, the best kind of industry track paper that uh, we selected in this conference is from Lixiang Luo and his team from IBM Research and uh, UC San Diego, NVM e-virtualization for cloud virtual machines. And so this was, according to our selection committee, the, the best paper in the industry and experience track this year. Uh, I don't know if any of the authors are here. Uh, I Can saw Silem yesterday. Not sure if he. I tried to to write. Uh, I write him this morning, but yeah. So unfortunately, I have not seen any of the authors here. But yeah, congratulations from our side. And you know, here you see again the the beautiful award which we're going to ship out uh, you know, as soon as we're done with the conference. So that was the industry and experience track. So now let's move on to the to the research track. And in the research track, we kind of applied the same principle, but and we again have two different uh, uh, winners, a runner up and an, and an overall winner. So the, uh, the, the runner up for the best uh, research track paper award goes to the paper oversubscribing GPU unified virtual memory implications and, su and suggestions by Xuan Ming Shao and his colleagues from Shanghai University. So again, my question, uh, are the authors here? I don't know if the time is very good for them. I don't think it is. <laughs> but anyway, so we are very, so this, I think this paper in particular made us very, very happy because one of the goals of, that we originally had when we were trying to do an ICP in, in China was also to extend the community a little bit in this area of the world. And so we are very happy that uh, we got uh, one really excellent contribution to the conference from China as kind of part of this extension. Um, now let's come, uh, let's go to the, to, the, to the best paper award in the research track and the paper that we have decided for here is the paper long tail toward automatic performance anomaly ex explanation in microservices by Richard Lee uh, and his colleagues from, well, various places, Meta, Palo Alto, University of Utah, Nokia Bell Labs. Um, congratulations to Richard, congratulations to all the other winners. Um, that's everything I have for today. Um, congratulations to all the reviewers, all the awarded paper authors, all the awarded, uh, every, everybody else who has papers or has asked questions or helped us make the ICP so far a success. Um, we're all winners in our books. <laughs> So Nico, do you know, do we have more program for today? No, we have, do we have so I would, I would stop the recording to open the floor for informal conversation, if you can stay. And we would leave the room open. Yeah. I hope you had the chance to grab a drink and stay around for a few minutes. Yeah. So let me end my presentation here.